I would like to one more time introduce uh, Wallace Marshall, uh, who's joining us from UCSF uh, in San Francisco. And like I already mentioned, Wallace did his PhD at uh, UCSF and then went to work with the uh, legendary Joe Rosen Rosenbaum, who I've had the pleasure of interacting with at MBL. And uh, he's now, Wallace is now at UC, back at UCSF and is interested in uh, looking at uh, molecular mechanisms that are controlling uh, flagellar length of uh, uh, basically. And before I go any further, I'll kind of give the floor to Wallace. And yeah, Wallace, go ahead, all yours. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for your patience um, with, with the technical issues. So I'm gonna tell you about our efforts to understand how cells control the length of flagella as a way to understand the more general problem of, of size control in biology. And this is gonna be the work of uh, two students, David Bauer and Kim Wemmer and a postdoc Hiro Ishikawa. So cells generally can make very complex and beautiful structures. Um, what's remarkable is that although we know a lot about the building blocks of these structures, we know much less about how those building blocks are assembled to give you these complex structures and of the appropriate size and position and shape. And so um, the idea is how can we learn more about, about um, what determines some ge geometry features like size. And we've chosen the, um, the flagellum as a model organelle to study size control because it's linear. And so it's a one dimensional size control problem and it's easy to see it's on the micron size scale. So it's very easy to, to visualize. And we're studying flagellar length regulation in Clemenomonas reinhardii, it's a unicellular green alga, which has excellent genetics, which is why, why we, we choose it. Now, as a reminder, the system we're studying is the eukaryotic flagellum, not bacterial flagella, which are entirely different. So eukaryotic flagella are microtubule-based structures. So you have nine microtubule doublets that push out a, a protrusion of the plasma membrane. So when we talk about length control of flagella, we really mean length control of the microtubules that make up the flagellum. And through a lot of work, we, we know that these microtubules are dynamic structures there's constant addition of new tubulin out at the tip of the flagellum, and it's balanced by constant removal of tubulin, which is why um, the, the length reaches a certain steady state length. And so length control becomes a question of how do you balance these two, uh, these two rates, assembly and disassembly, to give you the length that you want. What we know is that the rate of disassembly is apparently length independent, so tubulin's constantly being removed no matter how long or short the flagellum is. And um, we have um, a lot, uh, measurements indicate that the assembly, the rate of assembly is going as one over the length. So as flagella get longer, they assemble more slowly. And that's because as flagella get longer, the, um, there are transport complexes that are required to move tubulin out to the tip. And the rate at which those complexes move into the flagellum goes down as one over L. What causes that length dependence of the transport complexes going in, we don't currently know. And we're exploring a, a variety of models to, to understand that. But the bottom line is, if you plot the two rates versus length, there's only one value of length where the two rates are equal to each other and that gives you a steady state solution. So we think that our model can explain a lot of things. It can explain the observed um, regeneration kinetics of flagella, for example. It can explain the ability of two flagella to equalize their length when one of them is severed. So we can explain a lot of sort of average behavior of the population um, with this model. And so, you know, as in any other physics problem, if you can explain the average behavior of your system with a model, the next way to test the model is to ask, can it also explain the fluctuations around that average? And so in this case, what's nice about um, Clementomonas is it has exactly two flagella. And so you can ask about correlated variation of the two flagella from cell to cell. Some cells have longer, some cells have shorter flagella, but you can also ask about the uncorrelated variation, the differences in flagella length within a cell. And traditionally in gene expression studies, for example, these, these two kinds of variation are decomposed as extrinsic and intrinsic noise. And there's, um, 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 well, let, let me just say that we can see both kinds of variation in, in flagella. So if I plot the length of, of the two flagella on, in a scatter plot where each dot is a cell, what you see is there's a certain scatter along the diagonal. So that's correlated variation um, from cell to cell. And there's also scatter perpendicular to the diagonal and that's variation within one cell. So we see both kinds of variation. Now this variation is not simply, it could simply be locked in. These are images from fixed cells. But if we look at living cells, we see actually lengths are fluctuating. So if we measure the difference in the length of the two flagella within a cell, and we plot the mean squared uh, change in that, in that difference versus the time lag, what we see in fact is that um, the, the, the um, lengths are, are constantly fluctuating and they actually are doing a constrained random walk. So at a certain length on the order of uh, uh, so, you know, square root of 12 microns, the, you, you, you see uh, less, uh, basically, a, 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 you don't see any fluctuations beyond that. And so in terms of talking about a control system, this really, in my opinion, is the main evidence that there actually is a control system, which you can fluctuate up to a certain point beyond that, the fluctuations are somehow being corrected. 
So that argues that there that there that there is some sort of no, you know, what we would call noise, a fluctuation source somewhere. And the question is, where is the noise? So um, again, as I mentioned, one typically would like to talk about intrinsic and extrinsic noise. Intrinsic meaning noise sources that are within the system. In this case, the system is the flagellum, and there also could be noise sources coming from the environment, which in this so the extrinsic noise. And in this case, the environment is actually the cell body, which the two flagella are attached to. And so you can imagine fluctuations in either of those contributing to the noise that we see. Now there are mathematical formalisms to uh, extract these components from the scatter plot that I showed you, but those assume things like independence of the two copies of the system, additive noise sources and so on, none of which we think are actually true in, in our case. So we wanna try to go for these noise sources a little bit more directly. So the first question is, well, is there any noise is there any intrinsic noise source inside the flagellum? Could it all be in the cell body? Now I've showed you that the flagellar lengths are fluctuating. So how would you explain that? Well, one way to explain it would be that if, um, suppose you have two flagella that are somehow different in terms of their ability to utilize precursor or something coming from the cell body so that their gain is, is, is different. Then if you have a fluctuation in, in whatever it is they're responding to like tubulin concentration and so on in the cell body, the two flagella would respond differently and that would actually give you changes in the difference between the two lengths. So we think this is probably not the case. Um, um, one reason we think that is because if we measure the lengths of two flagella and ask which one is longer, we see that if you subtract one from the other, the sign fluctuates. And so over time, the longer flagellum will become the shorter one and so on, which is, which is harder to account, at least in a trivial way with a fixed gain difference in the two flagella. So we think there probably is noise going on within the flagellum, which is not surprising because they're undergoing this dynamic assembly process, which is going to have a certain level of intrinsic fluctuation just because of on and off rates of tubulin and so on. What about the cell body? Is it possible that there's any noise coming from the cell body? We've seen that there's correlated variation in the length from cell to cell, but because, but it is, which, which, which you think, okay, that's cell to cell variation in something. However, if you have a noise source inside one of the two flagella, and then the two flagella are communicating, and we know they communicate, they, they compete for tubulin, they can exchange transport complexes um, between them. So if they're communicating, it's possible that, that you end up having a variation in the second flagellum in response to a fluctuation in the first that could lead to a correlated change from cell to cell. So to try to test this, um, what we've done is to take cells, um, remove the flagella entirely using pH shock, so the flagella will pop off and they grow back. And so um, if you look at the flagella length before you do this, and then, and then you look at the length they regenerate to after they've done this, the only thing that was retained was the cell body. So if you were to see correlation in the lengths before and after regeneration, that would argue that something has been um, propagated through the cell body. And so using customized microfluidic devices uh, uh, developed by, by David Bauer, um, what we've been able to, he, basically he was able to then do the pH shock and watch flagella regenerating in this device. And the result is that indeed you see a, a, a correlation of the, of the length after regeneration to, to the length before removal, which is implying that, that indeed there's a cell to cell um, variation source, which we would call extrinsic noise. So given that there are these noise sources, the uh, uh, interesting question is, well, can we now go you know, use the noise measurement as a new way to screen mutants and look for genetic determinants of, of, of fluctuations? And I, I won't go through all of these, but what I wanna say is that it, this, this is just a measurement of the, of the intrinsic noise. So, so the, the, the fluctuation between, the variation between the two flagella lengths. And there's a class of mutants that all have increased variation in length between the two flagella. And these are called LF1, 2, 3, and 4. LF stands for long flagella. So what we see is that any mutation and actually also chemical perturbations like lithium that make flagella get longer, anything that makes flagella get longer also increases the apparent um, uh, differences in length between the two flagella. So why would that be? Going back to our model, right? So we have assembly rate and disassembly rate and they balance at one length. If you think about this model, the rate at which you um, could damp out a fluctuation, if you had an intrinsic fluctuation, so suppose you were kicked off of, from your steady state value, the rate at which you would re return to that value depends roughly on the slope of intersection between these two curves, right, in a linearized noise model. And so it turns out that if you go in this model and make any parameter change that would give you an increase in length, either you which mean either you would lower the rate of disassembly or increase the rate of assembly somehow with, by changing the transport complexes. No matter how you do it, it always is the case that it will decrease the intersection slope and therefore decrease the, the speed at which a fluctuation would get damped out. So the prediction is that you would see more variation because any fluctuation that happens just persists longer. And you should be able to see that if you look at, at, at the actual time series data. And indeed what we see, if we look at autocovariances versus time lag, we see that indeed the long flagella mutants have a longer correlation time. So their fluctuations are damped out uh, uh, more slowly. 
So we think actually that our, our, our simple model can explain a lot of what we see in terms of the fluctuations. Um, and now we want to try to, use, to look maybe for other kinds of mutants that we haven't thought of before. So I want to thank you all for listening and acknowledge the people who've, who've done the work and our generous funding sources and our great collaborators. And I'll stop and take any questions. And I don't know how the questions work through YouTube. So someone, I guess, is mediating that. But uh, so we're going to have me and Sandeep. Uh, we have people reading the YouTube stream. And some people kind of raise questions from there. But before we kind of do, are we videos those questions, uh, in case somebody in the panel has those quest has any questions on this, you would be very happy to kind of start with that first. Yeah. Good. So I'll just unmute myself. Um, this is really interesting. So I was wondering, you know, you were showing us the data for the long flagella mutants. I don't know, are there any short flagella mutants? Because then, um, you know, based on your graph, we would predict yep. that the. Yeah. The so would be yeah. Good. So. So these three, SHF1, 2, and 3, are short flagella. Um, SHF2 has the most dramatic. So it is, as you say, so you actually see a, a, a slight reduction. Um, SHF1, the issue here is that um, some of these mutants are not, um, the, the penetrance is not, is not amazing. So, so it's SHF1, meaning that some of the cells have short flagella, but some don't. Um, and so I think that's why maybe we don't see such a huge difference there. But yeah, I, so there's a, a general trend in Clemenomonas uh, genetics studies of length control that everyone studies the long flagella mutants and everyone ignores the short flagella mutants. And I don't know if it's a Freudian thing or something. For example, all the LFs have been cloned and uh, the, the SHFs, not so much. And I think, I think you're right, they're equally informative. Yeah, would that see. be because would that be because the mutants are it's just that they are easier to view and easier to quantify because they're yeah it's it, it, partly that so I mean it's very yeah it's it, it's very striking when you see a flagellum that's twice as long as you ever see in wild type and so I think that that's part of it uh, um yeah that's certainly part of it they're a little easier to work with but on the other hand there's a lot of short flagella mutants out there which I think are all super super interesting right excellent I had a question. What exactly happens in a pH shock, Wallace? Uh, does the flagella just fall off without changing anything in the cell body, or? Is well, right. So, so you've you know, the cell certainly. So okay. So yeah. So so the flagella pop off. There's a there's a contractile system that basically pinches off at the base. The flagellum pops off. The cells survive really well. Um, if you yeah. So so let's just say the cells survive really well. Um, there's a gene expression program that turns on. If you have, there are mutants that don't, th that are unable to sever their flagella in response to the pH shock. And those mutants do not turn on the gene expression program. So at least that part is not, so that's something in the cell body that's not actually directly dependent on the pH shock. Um, but yes, I, I think your, your point is well taken. Uh, who knows what's going on in the cytoplasm when you pH shock, rip off a chunk of, you know, a piece of the organelle, probably some cytoplasm is bleeding out, although maybe not that much. Um, it would be interesting to study that. And I, I don't think we, we really have a good handle on, on that. So, so, you know, in, in cases where, so, so the fact that we saw, if we, if we hadn't seen any correlation of regeneration, one could certainly imagine that there had still been some extrinsic source that was now getting erased or perturbed by the shock. So I think this is one of those, you know, it's a, it was a class B experiment and only one outcome would really be informative. Yeah. Thank you. I think Ken had a question. Yeah, hi, this is Ken Anderson from the Technical University of Denmark. A uh, more general question. So can they actually adaptively change the length of their flagella depending on the circumstances? I mean, they are presumably using these to move or to catch food and there will be an optimal length in those circumstances. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good point. So let's see, I don't think I have all the slides for this, but one thing I could tell you is that clearly for swimming, so this is a plot of, this is a heat map of swimming speed versus the length of the two flagella. Yeah, so in, so in wild, so, so using a variety of mutants and so on, we, we can probe this whole space. And what we see is that there's this very narrow regime of extremely good swimming. Wild type cells shown here as dots scatter. They're, they're not just in the best swimming regime. So they're a little bit off, they're off diagonal. Now wild type cells, and I don't have a slide for this, um, wild type cells do two kinds of motility. They swim through the water, but they also glide on surfaces. And if you do the same kind of plot for gliding speed, what you see is the opposite, which is that in order to glide, so that they glide using motors in the two flagella and cells that have, that have highly equal lengths flagella aren't able to make any progress because they go back and forth and never get anywhere. Whereas if one flagella is much longer then they go in that direction. 
And so one possibility is that there's, they're not fully optimized for swimming because they want to retain the ability to glide. I mean, I, I, I know people hate this kind of evolutionary, you know, bed hedging argument, but I mean, at least what we see is that um, if they were to have really equal length flagella, they would not be able to glide. Now gametes who are specialized, so if, if we nitrogen starve the cells, you make gametes that are really only trying to mate. And the way clemmy mates is, is the tip to tip connection of its two flagella. So the two things they have to do is they've got to swim and they've got to join the tips of both of their flagella to bring the cell bodies together, both of which you can imagine are, work better when the flagella are equal in length. And in, if you do the same kind of plot in gametes, they're much more on the diagonal, which again is suggestive that they're somehow you know, designed to do that or you know, selected to do that. Um, so that's rough answer to your question. Things like you know, if, if we make the cells swim in different viscosity media, I think we haven't really explored those kinds of questions as much as we want yet. Okay. So we have a couple of questions from the audience now from, from the YouTube live. And uh, first question comes from Marco Polen, who I uh, think is at, Mar at Warwick. And he said, if mutants, uh, LF mutants, the distal extra part looks quite different from the proximal part, the more floppy part. Have you looked at how the intrinsic noise increases versus flagellar length? Wait, say that again. So in, in LF mutants, the distal extra part looks quite different from the proximal part. And oh, have, I you don't know. At, have you looked at intrinsic noise? Like? I think I, I really is, have you looked at intrinsic noise itself and how does that affect? Yeah, so I don't know. In, in my hands, I'm not so sure I see a difference between the, the different parts of the, of the flagellum and the LF mutants. It, to me, it looks like the LF ones, yeah, they, they have this sort of this curly Q, but it looks to me like it's the same curvature just extending out. Um, so he may know something that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he knows many things that I don't know, but about this particular point, um, so you know, I, I would love to hear more about that, um, and maybe we could try to try to look at that. Like, if there's a if there's a, like a nice clear demarcation between two different zones, it would be great to study the fluctuations of those two zones, for example. Yeah. Right. Because I think he's curious on how, how does noise change as a function of length. That, that's where he was going towards. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 Right. I have to think about that. So, I mean, it is certainly true. Let's see. Yeah. So, I guess the question would be, you know, we know there's a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variation in some of the LF mutants. So if you were to look at ones that happen to be in the same size range as a wild type, would you see a, a difference in, would you, would you see a wild type like level of fluctuation? I never, I, I never thought that, about that. that that's a, yeah, I think that's a question, interesting question. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of moved to the next one there. Uh, we have a question from Yannick Kondev, Grandeis. He said, what molecular machineries do the LF mutants affect? Ah. So, um, so LF4, so okay, no one knows directly. So, so all the LFs have been cloned. Two of them are kinases, but we don't know the substrates of the kinases and we don't know what's, what upstream signals regulate the kinases. So, so, it's hard, so we don't know directly what they regulate. What we know is that um, in all of them except, so LF3 is hard to study, but LF1, 2, and 4 in all, all of those cases, what we see is an increase in interfacial transport machinery. So at any given length, we see the IFC machinery being injected at a higher rate. And, um, and, and, and this is also true with lithium treatment. So what we think is at least what they're affecting is, is, is IFT and they're bumping it up and that's why length is longer. LF3, um, our measurements didn't really work out because it, the phenotype is so variable that all the cells we ended up getting measurements from happen to have well type length flagella. So we don't know L3 could be different, but I, I doubt it. Okay. So one, one interesting question that I've often wondered myself uh, is from Dave Shankar Banerjee. And he said, can you, can you actually make a perturbation in the cell to make sure, just by perturbing itself to make, to make, to make the two flagella different, differently sized? Well, we have, so in Clement we, we, we don't see that. Um, but in, in other algae, there's um, basically the age of the basal body determines how long the, the, the flagella are. So you have unequal length flagella and, it's, and, and, and by, by the length of the flagella, you could infer which of the two basal bodies um, um, was nucleating it. So, I mean, if, so the basal body is, you know, part, is, is part of the cell body. So you can imagine retuning something about the basal body. Clemenomonas, there are mutants which, in which either the mother or daughter basal body fails to make the flagella, which is sort of an extreme version of, of that question. But I've never, I don't think we have any mutants, but maybe one could try to find alleles of, of those same genes that might make one flagellum shorter than the other. I mean, my, my suspicion is that it's actually hard to make them equal. Well, I don't, I don't know, actually, I, I'm gonna hold off on, on what my suspicion is about that. 
But I mean, I think if you look at most, I, I, I and this may, may be, um, you know, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't, enough, don't know enough of, of, to be able to answer this. It'd be interesting to know which is the generic case. If you just look at sort of all of algal biodiversity, is it more common to have the two be equal or be different? And is that because there's selective pressure to make them equal or because it's easier to make them equal? Right, yeah, that's something I've often wondered even looking at the movies and at, uh, your movies at the MBL. So we one more, one last question Sandeep has from the audience. Um, yeah, so what, there is one question. We, I mean, we have just time for one question, one more question. Uh, so it's an interesting one. So Sri Vidya Ayer Vishwas asked this question. Uh, it's about what your thoughts are on the title of the, of the, the, the workshop that we have. Is the search for underlying physical principles a wild goose chase? So what do you think about that? No, I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the I think the issue is uh, whether, whether one can do that without having to worry about the molecular details or whether you have to know every gene and, and how they all work in order to be able to understand it. And my, my feeling is that it's the other way around and that I think if you have some basic idea of the principles of how the system works, it will actually help you understand the, you know, what different mutant phenotypes are and actually maybe identify genes that you wouldn't have thought of. And I love the idea of basically trying to do a physical principle directed genetic screen where you come up with a, you know, a, a mutant phenotype that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So I, I'm gonna say that, yeah, I, I hope it's not a wild goose chase. Thank you Wallace for saving us. <laughs> also, uh, also Wallace, uh, there are many other questions. So if you can uh, go to the YouTube channel and answer them, that would be fantastic. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. So, um, so now we'll go to the next speakers. Um, so clearly one of the, one of the things uh, in uncovering the physical principles of size control is that it is important or imperative, I would say, to have a vibrant dialogue between theory and experiments. However, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, in most cases, this happens only after the experiments are done. So in this context, we thought that it would be a great idea to have a tag team effort by a theorist and an experimentalist. Our next speakers are Lishi and Shashank. Uh, so Lishi is an assistant professor of physics at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She was a grad student with Yane Kondev at Brandeis and the co-director of the quantitative biology program there. Shashank is, of course, the host. He's an assistant professor of physics and cell biology at uh, Emory University. He trained with Jeff Gallis and Bruce Good at Brandeis and Marie France uh, in, uh, in Paris. So it's up to them. So they'll be talking about size control of actin. Up to you. OK, my screen is visible, I hope. Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Sandeep, for this nice uh, introduction. And once again, I'm, I'm really glad that we could continue with the workshop as, as we had initially planned with a bit of a delay. And I'm really happy that all of you are uh, able to join us here. So before I jump into the details of our, our research, I'm just, like Sandeep said, this talk is really kind of a comment by itself because Lishi and me, we've been talking to each other for many, many years. And we thought it would be a good opportunity to present how theorists and experimentalists can work together and not, not one after the other. And that's kind of how the work is going to be brought as well today. So on the screen right now, I have put in a couple of examples of two different cells. One on the left is a neutrophil doing something that the immune system cell always do in your body, all the, pretty much all the time. They're trying to chase bacteria and trying to kill bacteria. On the right is a fish keratocyte trying to reach a virtual wound. The process on the left side, which is the immune system trying to capture bacteria, normally happens all the time, as I said, on our body. Every now and then, every 100 years or so, it actually fails so miserably that we all end up with masks on our faces and in the quarantine like we are right now. Uh, more importantly, these two processes, as you can see, the cells are moving very differently. And fish have been around for about at least about half a billion years. And we human beings have been, have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years. It turns out, although there's such a big difference in evolutionary time scales, both of these processes and the way these cells are moving at the, at the heart, at the molecular scale, they're actually following a very, sim very similar process. The same protein lies at the center of all of this process. So if you would zoom into uh, and deeper with electron microscopy into the cell that is migrating from left to the right, what you'll see is you'll see it's a mesh-like structure, which might remind you, many of you guys, of, uh, of when a garden goes bad and your grass dries up, that's basically how it looks like. If you zoom in further, what you'll see is you'll see a, a filament-like structure, a single actin filament, that's what it's called an actin filament, a helical structure, about five nanometers in, uh, in diameter. And the big question we've been really asking is so far what you've seen in the images that you saw, all of these actin structures were rather static. And they were, you know, because they were EM pictures, 
In reality, however, it turns out these structures are extremely dynamic. And as you see in this movie on the left side from Wick Small's lab, a classic movie where actin has been labeled fluorescently, everything that's white is actin. And as the cell is moving upwards from bottom to the top, what you see is you, see, you start seeing uh, the actin network in the back of the cell is getting removed or disassembled. And the network in the front is actually being assembled. And that really shows to you how dynamic this entire system really is. At the molecular scale, if you kind of zoom in a three orders of magnitude into, at, the, at, the, at the monomer level, it turns out actin can be either monomers, and these monomers can self-assemble into to make filaments. The filaments by themselves are polar structure. They have a plus end right here, and they have a minus end. And as the name suggests, at the plus end, or it's, as it's called the barbed end, the monomers get predominantly added, and the filaments depolymerize from the minus end. And the big question that the field has been trying to grapple with and, and, and really address over the last few decades even, is, is really how do you control these two processes, the assembly and the disassembly, because the balance of these two processes is actually what gives you cell movement, or that, that's exactly what happens in a cell. And the question we've been asking really is, how do cells do it? As it turns out, so far I've only shown you actin in the context of cell migration, a motile cell, but let me tell you something very interesting. If you take all the proteins of your body, all the protein mass of your body, about 5% of that protein mass is going to be one single protein, and no points for guessing, that's my favorite protein, actin. Actin is a really important protein. In many of your cellular processes that require force, like cytokinesis, cell movement, phylopodia, phytocytosis, most of these processes is actin that's involved. And it turns out cells have devised over the last, you know, many, many millions of years, or billions of years rather, they've devised different processes to control actin growth that can be controlled spatially. And it can be, and, and also you can control the turnover of the actin structures because you need to be able to control actin differently in different parts of the cell. And our, our challenge really is. How do cells do it? How do, you, how do they control all these different reactions and give you this emergent dynamics? As it turns out, classically actin filaments were thought to follow these four steps. A filament would get nucleated from actin monomers. When the filaments, once the filament was formed, the filament would grow at the plus end. At some point, the filament would get tapped, the growth would be arrested, and then the filament would somehow get severed and broken down. That's how actin treadmilling was, was thought of classically. However, as with most things biology, it's complicated. It turns out there are hundreds of proteins that have been discovered over the last couple of decades, which, which, which can all act on the same actin filaments. There are proteins that can elongate filaments, that can block filaments, that can break them down, that can branch them, bundle them, so there are a bunch of different activities. And as physicists, we are interested really is to say, how do we, can we actually identify common rules that would actually be able to control the growth of actin filaments for the system? If we can talk to you about mostly about Awesome. So our approach in you know, getting at this question is going to be a bottom-up kind of an approach. We want to start with individual filaments that's kind of akin to having all these kind of, um, you know, if you want to make a bicycle, you can make them out of so many different types of components. So we're going to start with first identifying what are the essential components required for assembly and disassembly. And then we're going to add other proteins in a stepwise manner to build up complexity. The, the goal over here is to use, um, to kind of use quantitative method and use theory to guide and design our experiments. So how are we gonna study it? The thing that we're gonna do is first of all, do an abstraction. We're gonna think of the actin filament as a one dimensional filament made up of monomers. These monomers can either be added with a rate K plus or they can be disassembled with a rate K minus. And what we're really interested in knowing is how does the length of our filament change as we have both these processes? In this particular talk, we're going to focus just on the growth part. Basically, when the monomer is, uh, when the filament is small in size and it gets bigger. And we are interested in understanding how does the growth rate of the filament change when you introduce different proteins? How does the concentration of these various proteins change this growth rate and also the distribution of size with time? So um, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, players that we're going to study and hopefully this will give you an idea of the methodology that we're gonna follow. In this video right now, you see the act, uh, a protein elongator acting on an actin filament. An actin filament by itself can grow, and that's what you see on the right-hand side, that it's growing slowly. But if there is a elongator in the mix, then the protein filament grows very fast. The elongator in this particular process is formant. Now this process can be studied uh, via simulations as well. So what you see on the right are the plots where a filament, a filament bound with formin is growing at a rate much faster than a filament which is uh, bare and does not have a filament. What I'm showing you uh, right now are several traces of the same simulation uh, scheme. Now, the problem with formins is that 
once they get on the filament, they tend to stay on for a really long time. The mean residence time is about 20 to 150 minutes. So that creates a real conundrum because if, you, if you're active, if your filament is growing in that time, then you can make actin filaments which are 900 microns in length. That's like saying that I'm in Rochester, New York right now, and you know I'm a little cell and my phylopodia are reaching Shashank all the way in, in Emory. Now, cell doesn't want to do that. You don't see that in phylopodia. So what it has a number of regulatory proteins that kind of help it kind of tune it a little bit down. One such protein is known as capping protein that, uh, that uh, Shashang introduced to you before. What a capping protein does is it blocks the filament from growing at all. So what you, in this video, what you see is a filament growing. And when you add capping protein, it just stops growing. If you go back to the simulation and kind of analyze that motion, you would see that the filament grows, uh, the bare filament grows at a particular rate. But then when you add capping protein, its activity is stopped. Well, so now I know three different types of bar dense, right? Like I can either be three and I grow slowly, or I can have form in and I grow fast, or I can get capped and not grow at all. Now, the real mystery over here is that people didn't, don't really know how capping protein and form in interact with each other. So as a theorist, what you can do over here is create the rules of engagement and then study what happens to your system if if you, um, you know, how, what happens to the system in every possible case. So what I'm showing you in this slide is one such proposal. You have a filament which already has a formin attached to it. This, this, since the filament already has formin, it grows at a specific rate. What can happen to this formin uh, filament is that it can get capped with a rate k on, or it can get uncapped with a rate k off. Now I put an additional rule that if, if my formin filament is capped, then it does not grow. So now let's see what happens when you put them all together. This is the, the, the trace that I started you with. The bare filament and the formin filament are growing at their specific rates. What you see in this plot is that the plots are quite linear. They grow like that. But once you add capping protein to this mix, what you find is that the growth is jagged. And as you increase um, and decrease your, as you modulate your rate of capping and uncapping, what you can get is small length as well as big lengths. Now, doing the simulation multiple number of times allows you to, allows you to uh, calculate the length distribution as a function of time. So over here on the right, I'm showing you a snapshot of what the distribution would look like if I, uh, if I stop the simulation at a particular point. And we are trying to understand what happens when you add capping protein and what happens when you don't add capping proteins. When you don't add capping proteins, the filaments tend to be long and tend to have a peak distribution of length. They're essentially growing at the rate formin would cap them. But once you add capping protein, the length to which you grow is smaller. But interestingly, if you look at the distribution, you can get various types of distribution if you modulate your capping and uncapping rates. So this is just to kind of show you this, this baby model is to show you what kind of games does a theorist play with this kind of a model um, uh, to answer this kind of a question. What's going to happen next is Shashank is going to tell you how we can get to this question or discovering the answer to this question through experiments. Thank you, Lishi. So the tool that we tool of choice that people use, uh, so microscopists use, is called epipherson microscopy. That's how you traditionally look at uh, person uh, uh, systems. And the big difference really, a big, big thing really is that if you, this is the objective right here, and that's your sample, when you throw, you, you push in light to excite all these molecules, all the molecules in the entire volume get excited and they all fluoresce, which leads to very good signal, but essentially the problem also is you have very high background. And that really prevents you from looking at individual molecules and individual filaments. What we've done is we use a technique that's called turf microscopy, which is total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, in which we do not eliminate the entire sample. We eliminate a very small region just above the glass slide. So what you end up doing is you end up eliminating only a few molecules on the glass surface. You have very high signal and you have very low background. So you can get a very good signal to noise. And that really allows you to see individual filaments. If I would now add monomers in the turf field, I would start get, observing individual filaments forming. And as you can see in real time, these are active filaments that are, that are growing very obvious that the plus end that is growing very fast. The minus end is not doing much at this point, but the plus end is growing relatively fast, which looks beautiful, except if it's very disorienting, at least for me already, that all these filaments are diffusing away thanks to Brownian motion and thermal fluctuation. That makes the analysis very difficult. And, it, and as I'll get, get there, it also makes it very difficult if any of you guys have done experiments with uh, introducing new conditions with the pipette on one side, Kim wipe on the other, the whole microscope shaking, two grad students holding the microscope, third postdoc holding the pipette, that gets really complicated. We're going to step back and make it a little bit easier. And together with my colleagues, Antoine and uh, Guillaume in the Cartier lab, in the, in the erstwhile Cartier lab, we have been using the system called microfluidics assisted turf. And that system really allows us to not only uh, study a lot of active filaments, but allows us to anchor filaments down on the surface. We can anchor the filaments from the plus end 
or the minus n. And if we now flow in actin monomers, what you see is you see these beautiful actin filaments that are all aligned together in the same field of view. And I can observe hundreds of filaments so that really allows you to make high throughput measurements. But because you are, your filaments are aligned, you can actually observe very small changes in elongation rate, which tells you what is bound at the end. Because if capping protein suddenly gets bound, the filament would immediately get lost. The formin gets bound, the filament would start going fast. So you can observe these very small changes very quickly. The second thing as a biochemist or biophysicist that's really important for us is to be able to define T0. At what point did what con uh, a new condition get introduced into the field of view? And that we can do as well because we, this system is controlled from the computer. We can actually change conditions very quickly. And that's exactly what we do. So we anchor the filaments down from the minus end, as you see right here, uh, using a seed. A formin gets attached to the plus end. And as expected, if I flow in actin monomers, the filament is going to grow fast. This is what is called a chymograph. All you need to remember really from the slide is this particular slope tells you how fast things are happening. This particular slope tells you the filament is growing very fast when formin is bound at the warp end. Now let's see what happens when you add capping protein. If the fields that is published for the past 20 years, the data was true, nothing should have happened because formin would first have to fall off very slowly by itself, as she mentioned, and then the capping protein can go on. When we did this experiment, we had formin on the barbed end, we introduced capping protein with actin monomers, and what you see is, voila, you see this jagged kind of growth, which might remind you a little bit of what she showed you. You don't see fast elongation as you expect, but you see this pausing of the formin every, every few seconds, or every few minutes rather. So what's really happening there? It turns out if you look more closely there, you have regions where formin is going to grow fast, and you have parts where formin gets paused. And it's not really clear at this point what is bound to the plus end because we, we can't see the, the molecules. However, what you can already appreciate is that instead of taking you know, 150 minutes now, this process only takes three minutes for the formin to get paused. You, you actually speed it up the process about 50 times faster. And this, like I said, it really, really can remind you of what Lishi's the theoretical predictions where we can now tune the concentration of capping protein, we can tune the mutants of capping protein, and we can basically explore the entire space space that you have between fast elongation and almost no elongation. And that's what we can do now with experiments. We can test those predictions. More importantly, uh, although I'm sure a lot of you who are uh, in the audience are convinced, I hope you're convinced that the formin and capping protein were both found at the barred end when there was a pause. But of course, you know, there's always the reviewer number three who never gets convinced. And thankfully so, because that really pushes the papers forward and the, and the field forward. So we were asked, can you actually show us that the formin and the capping protein are both found? And the way to do that is actually to label them. And that was work done also, also in the Gallus in the Good Lab, where you can label formin, label capping protein directly. The, the green dot will be formin, the red dot is going to be capping protein. We expose that in the same area in our reaction. What you'll see in the movie right here is this, a filament that is in cyan color actin filament with a formin at the plus end is growing with labeled capping protein in red around in solution. If I play the movie here, the filament grows until at some point the filament gets paused. And if you look closely at the paused event at, at the plus end, you'll see there's a green dot and there's also a red dot, which makes the whole thing yellow. And that tells you that the formin and the capping protein were both present at the same time. At some point, the, formin, the capping protein falls off and the formin regrows, starts regrowing again, which is again, very similar to what we shared. Uh, more interestingly, we can, also, we can also kind of repicture that exact process in this lovely animation from my former colleague, Julian Eskin, where uh, you can see a filament that is growing with a formin bond bar then, at some point it gets capped and then the formin gets kicked out or the capping protein can get kicked out. So you really can, can see now how the cells can tune elongation rate by this very simple reaction. This is not to say that's exactly how cells do it always. This just tells you that this very simple mechanism can already predict how carefully you can control the size. You can all, of course, add other proteins that can help you tune even better. And with that, it, it brings me to my summary of, my, of our presentation. But what I've shown you really is that it, just like cooking, you can't really bake your best favorite dish by salt and pepper. You really need, you know, you need turmeric, he's being from India. I need my turmeric, I need my coriander and my chilies and everything else to really kind of just get the right flavor. And that's what I think we, we think cells really do. They really are able to use these different tuning knobs that they have to get just the right elongation rate. And that's how they can change things in, in time as well as different spaces in, inside the cell. And the question of course uh, is where do you go from here? And so far we've only shown you a very simple reaction, an elongator and a blocker binding together the plus end. However, as I said, as in biology, like always, most like, unlike what physicists and uh, chemists might not like, biology is complicated. It turns out there, like I said, lots of proteins that act on the plus end, that bind formins and capping proteins, the proteins that bind the branch, to debranch the filaments, the proteins that we have discovered, depolymerize active filaments. So our real, our, our real push for the next few years is really going to be about, can we actually use work together, like, you know, how to use theory and experiment and kind of learn from each other, talk to, by talking to each other, to really get at how, how all these proteins work together to give us complex behavior. 
And that, with that, it brings me to the end of my presentation, or our presentation rather in this case. Uh, and I thank you all for listening to us. And more importantly, I would like to thank our mentors who kind of taught us everything that we know about biology, physics, and biochemistry fact and satisfactory. Equally, we would like to thank um, uh, MBL because that was the place that uh, Shashank and I actually met. So we want to thank our, our previous directors, Wallace, Jennifer, Rob, and I know that Dan is also in the mix for creating a space where theorists and experimenters can actually dream up uh, you know, science together. And we just started a new lab. So if this kind of work excites you, if you're curious, get in touch. Our email IDs are all over there. We will be very, very happy to talk about all of this. Thank you. You're gonna work on cytoskeleton or single molecules, get in touch. Thank you. Do we have questions from the panel? I think Sandeep, is, oh, I think Sandeep is muted. Ah, sorry, I, I was like, I was saying a lot of things without uh, unmuting myself. So, uh, so, uh, so I had one question. So did you guys look at the noise, like coefficient of variation um, uh, from, as a function of time and see how they compare like from theory and experiments? That's exactly what we want to do. Uh, the, in the measurements, the length distributions are not there yet. There's just single line traces right now. But the mm -hmm. work is to kind of, you know, get high throughput data for all of these different conditions and really look at, uh, like you said, coefficient of variation as, as a function of time. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. And also, um, I mean, I was, I was. This is kind of again. I mean, coming from this gene expression field. So, do you do you guys think that noise uh, in like in actin filament length, or I mean, or basically basically that, or even w Wallace's talk? I I had that question, but I couldn't ask. So, uh, do you guys think that it has any functional role here? Um, like like gene expression noise seems to be something that's perhaps important for, for biology. So I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that. I have some thoughts. The thoughts is that, you know, I think it really depends on what the structure wants to achieve, like the function of that structure. If, if you want that, that structure to do a specific job, which is related to its size, you probably want to control that size really well. But if you know, if the function is to kind of, you know, like explore distances or move in any kind of condition, I think it really depends on the function of that organelle. That's what my thinking is, but obviously I, I'm, I'm, you know, speculating there. Uh, but are there any experiments where people have shown that it can have any role, uh, functional role? I'm not so sure. I think we could, people have looked at the barbed end uh, elongation with, you know, just having proteins that would be able to depolymerize for very short periods like profilin. There's something interesting, but it doesn't get anything as close interesting to what happens in the microtubule plus ends. Okay, uh, so we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, I, think, I think Wallace had a question Wallace right a here. Question. Oh, Wallace has a question. Oh, yeah, is that okay? So I was just going to ask, you know, as you try to go to, um, you know, build in more complexity in the models, is like, I, I can see how if, if you have, say, two factors that both have their own on and off rate, you can model those and, and, and ask how often do you have, you know, all possible combinations. But then if those two things are talking to each other and regulating, you know, if one binds and regulates the off rate of the other, is there a nice, like, what is the sort of a general framework where you, where you for, for modeling that? You just, just, just like, an, in, in, you just enumerate all the states and get their energies or something? Or how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I can answer that question. So in, in these kind of simulation, what you have is you associate a rate with every transition that's happening. So in that case, if they're talking to each other, that would be a separate transition. We'll have to think of a rate that is reasonable to put over there that's where you know you have to go to you have to talk to your favorite experimentalist or go to research to you know research paper to see if that paper is there it's already published or not and kind of use those rates as an input to your model and then see what kind of behavior you get i mean i want to stress on the fact that this is a really small uh, like you know number of steps that i'm enumerating right now but it, what it makes you do is create a simulation system where your analytics and your simulation work really closely with each other so you know that that's perfect if you add something to it, even if you can't solve it analytically, at least the simulation can take you so far. So uh, adding transitions doesn't uh, take that much time or effort in, mm -hmm. in a simulation code. Obviously, it takes like one grad student or a postdoc to do all of that. But in simulation, you can do that really fast. Now that, that's, something, that's something I have learned I mean, over the last week working together on the presentation with Lishi. I've learned really how theorists operate and things that take us you know, half a year, one year. Uh, all I had to tell her was, can you make this mutation there? And she was like, done. So that, that's, that's, really, that's really the power, I think, of working together instead of, you know, doing experiments and then going to theorist. 
that's something we, I've, I've learned at least as a person, as a scientist. Okay, so uh, so uh, we have a question from, uh, I mean, we have many questions from the audience, but one uh, is from Navish that I would like to ask. Uh, so he, he asked, like, how does this, these two, this two factor system, two factor system prevent the filament from growing forever? In the experiment, the filament kept growing because the capping protein kept falling off, right? So that's his thing. Uh, so in, in, the, in this case, capping, sorry, can you phrase that one more time? Yeah, so he's, he's like, how does this two factor system prevent the filament from growing forever? That's so essentially what you, what you can do is you can think of capping protein right now, the capping protein kept falling off, but if you can change the concentration of capping protein, as soon as one falls off, the next one would bind. That would be one way. So at that point, the formula would always be, always be capped because as soon as one molecule falls off, the next one is going to be bound because you have high concentration. And you can also imagine different capping proteins have different affinities. We only work with one, one, one particular isoforms. You can have different uh, type, types of capping proteins, essentially. That, that's how I would, I would kind of think of it. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. You can, have mutation, you can also have mutations that can make capping protein stronger or weaker. I see. Okay, uh, there is another question um, uh, from Marco Polin. So in microtubules, fast polymerization uh, can lead to lattice defects. Is there something equivalent in uh, actin? Well, we've been dreaming of that for actin for such a long time. Uh, with microtubules, you have all these things that you can study along the length. In actin, it's kind of been a challenge. The only thing we know in actin really is that uh, you have the age of, depending on the hydrolysis state of ATP, you have, you have differences in the plus end, the bulk of the filament, that's, the plus end is ATP, a bit further is ADPPI, and the rest of the filament is considered to be ADP. That's the only difference we know in an active filament along the length. Apart from that, there's no, no real structural difference that we are aware of that can happen. Mm, I see. Yeah, that, that's what I would, uh, I'm aware of. Thanks. The other question uh, from Angelica, do the experimentally measured length distributions also match the theoretically predicted length distributions? And can you experimentally modify on and off rates to test the experiment theory match further? So that's. So I'll, I'll take. I'll let, let Lishi go jump first on that one. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, we we would like that. I think that's why we're talking to each other because we want to get high throughput data for all of this. We right now I've seen some traces. Uh, you know, we see some lens, but I want to get more data in order to kind of create those distributions. Right. And I said, and and to answer the second part of the question, it's definitely possible to change those rates. And like I said before, we, there, the mutants of capping protein that we know exist that bind a free, a free barb them differently. So we expect that they would also bind the form and bond them differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there is another question from Rishika. What promotes the capping protein to attach and fall off later? What promotes capping protein to fall off and attach later? Yeah. It's basically, it's, it's, it's a electrostatic interaction. So there's no, there's, no, there's no covalent bonding between the capping protein and the formin, uh, sorry, yeah, and the barb then. Capping protein binding, it's a, it's a random process that depends on the concentration and the dissociation is, an, you know, it has a certain inherent off rate. And that, that's what leads to dissociation of capping protein. But there are other proteins that are in, involved in cells, for example, Carmel and uh, CN85 that actually effectively promote capping protein dissociation. They can bind cap, cap barb 10 and actually dissociate capping protein faster. So the protein that can enhance those uh, bindings or dissociation rather. Okay. I think we, uh, there are some other questions, but perhaps the speakers can go and, and uh, uh, like you and Lishi can actually perhaps answer them. So we have to go to the speaker. Uh, thanks again. Thanks a lot for uh, the great talks and also um, the answering the questions. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Kinnereth Karen. Uh, she's a professor in the physics department at Technion in Israel. She did her PhD in physics from uh, Technion uh, with Professor Elis, Elis Brown and Professor Uri Sivan and followed it up with a postdoc with Julie Theory at Stanford. And she, her lab is generally interested in the biophysical aspects of cell motility and now up to her, she'll talk about. Okay, so thank you for the invitation to talk in this interesting uh, symposium. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about size determination, but I'm gonna talk about a, a related a question in spirit, which is what determines the speed of a motile cell? So I'm gonna focus on the millipodial motility, as you can see here in this uh, fish keratocytes that you already saw in uh, uh, Shashank's talk and, and Lishi's talk, which is actually a great introduction for my talk to look at actin dynamics. Um, so this is one of the best studied models for uh, actin-based uh, cell motility. And the first thing you go as an experimentalist to measure is measure the speed of this cell. And you can see here um, results from measurements we did in keratocytes, which show you the uh, variation in the uh, speed in the population of cells, as well as the variation in individual cell over time. And the basic question I want to ask today is what determines the speed of a cell? Uh, I'll simplify my model system even further and focus on these uh, fragments, which are basically these standalone lamellopodia, which contain the actin network 
that drives this type of movement uh, with, surrounded by a membrane and not much else. The basic molecular mechanism for this type of motility has been uh, um, understood for quite a while, at least in, in gross details. Uh, this is a famous scheme from a review by, by Tom Pollard from uh, about 20 years ago showing what's called the dendritic nucleation model. And the basic idea is that nucleate, nucleating promoting factors localized to the leading edge of the cell. They nucleate actin filaments into this branch structure and there's continuous dynamics with assembly of actin subunits into these filaments. Uh, as the uh, actin subunits assemble onto the filaments, the membrane is pushed forward, the actin network is pushed away from the leading edge there's ATP hydrolysis in the, uh, within the filaments, which destabilizes them. And with the help of a host of uh, auxiliary factors, there's disassembly. So there's a continuous uh, cycle of assembly at the leading edge, treadmilling and disassembly, and reassembly of these same components. Uh, here you can see an example of that in these fragments. What you're seeing here is a movie of a, uh, where we've added those low levels of phalloidin to label the actin network that allow us to follow its dynamic. And you can see very nicely this treadmilling of the actin network looks like snowflakes with the actin moving away from the leading edge in the cell frame of reference. If you look at the lab frame of reference, you actually see that the actin network is stationary, nearly stationary relative to the uh, substrate, which is another simplification of this model system. So basically cell speed here is equal to the polymerization rate. Now, how does polymerization generate forces? So you saw in the previous talk, this uh, reaction kinetics, where you think of the assembly of a, a subunit onto an existing filament. If you let this reaction uh, reach equilibrium, that there will be no net elongation in the, uh, in the filament and the free energy associated with polarization will be zero. But cells actually work to generate an excess concentration of, of monomers much higher than this critical concentration. So there's a free energy gain in this polarization reaction. And this can be harnessed to generate mechanical work uh, this is done through a um, mechanism called the Brownian ratchet, first uh, um, identified by George Oster and, and uh, colleagues. And the basic idea is that now if we have this polymerizing filament uh, against the load, either the load can fluctuate due to thermal fluctuations or the filaments itself can fluctuate. And if there's a large enough gap that opens, a subunit can enter and it will ratchet against backward fluctuations. And you can get a sense of the force that can be generated by this uh, Brownian ratchet if you compare the work needed to add a subunit, which is the force times the size of a subunit, to this free energy gain from polymerization. And if you put in reasonable concentrations for actin monomers, you can see that this force is in the piconewton range. So this is how polymerization translates into force. Now at the leading edge of the cells, things are more complicated. It's not a single filament that's pushing a load, but rather it's a distributed motor with a network of filaments. These network of filaments are attached through adhesion complexes to the uh, substrate. Um, so the pushing forces due to the polymerization are actually going against the, the cell membrane. Uh, and this is done cooperatively, so the load is shared among the different filaments. So going back to our question of what determines cell speed, as I told you in keratocytes, polymerization rate is uh, equal to the cell speed. So what will determine the, uh, the speed is the load, the load that is uh, exerted by the, uh, by the membrane, how this load is shared among the filaments, and the dynamics of the polymerization and the relevant actin pool that allows for uh, the polymerization. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, an oversimplification. There can be other factors that uh, are involved. For example, in some cases, there can be hydrostatic pressure that helps put, pull the leading edge. And there are other factors that could become rate limiting, such as adhesion dynamics and, and membrane flow. But in keratocytes, it seems that this is a reasonable picture to think of the polymerization motor, the forces generated by the polymerization motor that are balanced by the load uh, generated by the membrane. So let's look at what we can say about these different factors. Um, so what's the load uh, th that the membrane is generating? So this depends on the tension in the membrane and we can measure that using a, a, a tether pulling assay. So these are experiments done a while back in my lab where we use a, a, we take a bead and we pull it with optical tweezers to pull a tether from the membrane of a motile cell. And from the force on this tether, we can extract the membrane tension and you can see here histograms of the values of membrane tension for cells and uh, fragments. And this will translate to a force uh, per unit length along the leading edge. So you're pulling from the upper and lower parts of the membrane. So the force will be equal to twice the membrane tension, uh, which is about 300 piconewtons per micron. So we have the force per unit length along the leading edge. 
Now this is district, this is uh, the load is shared among the network of uh, filaments, and obviously this will depend on the structure of the filament. We can get information about this from looking at these uh, at the structure using EM microscopy. Here you see this beautiful image from Tanya Svetkina showing you the dis the distribution of uh, actin filaments at near the leading edge of a motile parent site. So we can get from these images the density of filaments near the leading edge as well as their angular distribution. Now again, things are somewhat more subtle here uh, to know if a filament is actually pushing against the membrane or not depends on uh, nanometer scale localization at the leading edge, which we're not able to extract from these uh, images. Also, when you're pushing against something floppy like the membrane, the load sharing depends on the properties of the membrane. But roughly, we can get an estimate of the force per filament by taking the force per unit length, which is we get from the measurements of the membrane tension and the density of the uh, filament per unit length. And we see that the force is about a piconewton per filament. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea of the load force per filament at the leading edge. What about what's going on uh, with the uh, polymerization dynamics? A few years ago, we set off to try to quantitatively analyze the actin dynamics in these uh, fragments, which are arguably the simplest system to, to look at this uh, problem. Now, the actin subunits in a cell are divided among different subpopulations. So we have the actin uh, subunits in the network. You'll have diffusing oligomers, which are generated when the network breaks down. And then you'll have a pool of uh, monomers. Now, this pool is quite diverse, actually. There will be different actin binding partners, for example, thymosin or profilin. The actin can be in different nucleated binding states with, um, with uh, ATP or ADP. And all these have a dramatic effect on the uh, polymerization kinetics of the actin. For now, I'll just for simplification, I'll just consider two pools of actin, one which I'll call the polymerizable pool, which is the part that can get assembled into the filament, and another that I will call the non-polymerizable pool of actin monomers. Now, as the cell is moving, these populations are dynamically interchanged, so we have polymerization and disassembly and, uh, um, into oligomers and then disassembly into, into monomers. Experimentally, we can discriminate between these subpopulations in, in cells via their binding. So we can have uh, uh, probes that bind differentially to filaments versus monomers. And also from the dynamics, we can have uh, um, we, the dynamics of a, a subunit in the network will be different from a dynamic in a diffusing filament or uh, a monomer. So I don't have time to go into the details of the measurements we did. I'll just kind of briefly take you through it. So we did quantitative staining where we were careful to calibrate our measurements so we could get absolute numbers rather than relative numbers. We used uh, FRAP analysis to look at the network dynamics. This allows us to look both on the fraction of uh, actin subunits in the network, as well as on the network turnover time. And we also looked at, uh, used fluorescent correlation spectroscopy to look at the, um, to look at the uh, uh, distribution of the diffusing subpopulation. We could see the, um, we could measure the fraction of oligomers in the, we show that there are oligomers and measure their fraction in the uh, uh, system as well as measure the diffusion of oligomers and monomers. And what all these, uh, this work, which took a good few years to, to complete, allowed us is now to look at this uh, coarse grained view of the actin dynamics in the lamellopodium. And I'll put absolute numbers on the uh, quantities, the size of these subpopulation and on the rates here. Uh, so what we see is that there are a very large amount of actin in the cells, about two millimolar of actin, about half of it is in filamentous form, half of this is in, in monomeric form, and we have also information on these uh, reaction dynamics, which at steady state, should uh, uh, all these fluxes should be uh, equal. And I'll focus on, on our question of what determines the rate of polymerization, which has to do with this uh, uh, monomeric populations of actin. And here our experiments are actually more limited because as I told you, we're not able to discriminate between the different uh, subpopulations of actin. So going back to this question of uh, the, what set cell speed. So I told you this, the uh, uh, polymerization rate is what determines cell speed. We have observations that tell us that the cell is moving at about 200 nanometers per second, which translates to about hundred subunits per filament per second. Now, what determines this rate? The textbook picture of uh, uh, the polymerization reaction is polymerization from uh, solution. So we have the subunits and they assemble into the uh, filaments. A couple of uh, uh, years ago, work from Dyke Mullen's lab suggested that there actually isn't an intermediate uh, pool of uh, uh, actin in this uh, uh, reaction, where actually there is a monomer bound to the surface 
and the, the actin monomers go from the solution to this monomer bound intermediate pool and from there to the uh, uh, polymerization. Basically, we don't understand what sets the rate. We don't understand exactly what's going on at the leading edge. Uh, I can go through both of these and in an individual cell, we actually don't know in a live cell what's going on. It can be either this or this or any combination of these. Uh, if we think of polymerization from solution uh, and we take the on and off rate measured in vitro and we know the force, uh, uh, per, uh, the, force the load force on the filament, we can use the, the known polymerization rate that we observe to extract what's the um, concentration of available monomers. What we find is that this is really a minute a part of the um, subunits that we see. So there's a millimolar of actin monomers in solution, only 20 micromolars according to these rates are available for polymerization. And we really don't understand what sets this uh, subpopulation of actin monomers. I'll say as a side note here that having this very small uh, population with this very that rapidly exchange with this very large pool actually buffers against fluctuations in space and time in the polymerization rate. If we think of polymerization from this uh, surface bound uh, monomers, then again, at steady state, what will set the uh, rate of polymerization is the balance between loading from the solution onto the surface bound and the depletion due to polymerization. But again, we really don't understand what, uh, what will be setting this uh, rate. Uh, so to summarize, I've taken the really most well understood uh, uh, example of cell motility. We have a really good sense of the molecular mechanism in a gross way. We have a pretty good biophysical picture of going on, of what's going on with the balance between the forces generated by the polymerization motor and the load due to membrane tension. But I'd argue that quantitatively, we're really at square one. We really don't know what sets the, uh, the rate of uh, cell movement. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank my coworker on, the, on this, my current lab. Most of this work was actually done by previous lab members, Dikla, Noah, Anon, and uh, Shlomit. And this has been a really long ongoing collaboration with uh, Alex McGilder. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Kinneret, for, for, the, for the great talk and kind of continuing on the, the, the best things in the world, Acton, of course. Uh, so if you have any questions from the panel, uh, please go ahead and uh, jump in. Well, I have a general question. Um, so. It seems to me like a very expensive process for movement that you have to assemble and disassemble all these molecules all the time. Is, is it possible from your quite complete understanding, in my view at least, to, to quantify what are the costs of movement here from, from very fundamental principles? Um, so, so I think you're totally, uh, um, uh, you're totally right um, uh, in, your, in your question. And I think the problem is even worse uh, if you look at the lamellopodium and it looks in, in many cells, actually the, the turnover length scale, so the, the, actually the lamellopodium actually turns over about eight to 10 times uh, from front to rear. So it's not only, um, you know, very, uh, um, uh, not an energetically uh, pl plausible way to, to have a motor that assembles and disassembles, it actually does it much more than needed for uh, 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 moving. Um, and there are other questions that obviously come from that, where how does the system uh, remain mechanically connected as it's turning over uh, um, uh, so fast? And I, I also think a nice thing to appreciate in relation to this question is where does a cell actually spend that energy, which here is not in intuitive in the way that it's basically, it's ATP hydrolysis, but it's using the ATP hydrolysis to break up the network and, and use it to, the, uh, to, to make filaments. Um, so from this, it's obvious that like energetics doesn't limit cell speed because you cycle so many uh, 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 times. But I'll also say that if you think of uh, cells moving in this way, the fact that the lamellopodium is so thin, if it were thick, then it would become uh, uh, prohibitively expensive to move by this uh, uh, mechanism. We still don't understand very well what the term is, the, the thickness, but uh, so I think it's an interesting question. I don't think it sets the physical limit for, for cell speed. But, uh, um, but still, it's an interesting aspect. I think Wallace has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, and if you're to this idea of sort of wasted motion of turning things over, you know, there's, there's a lot of, me of mechanical machines where you sort of waste excess motion in order to get more power, like, you know, you know gearing down or, or, or um, you know, block and tackle and things. Is there, is there any, any way to argue that by, by doing m many more rounds of turnover than you would need to do, you will you can generate more force than, than force beyond that, that 
what would what would stall a, a, a single turnover if the if the coupling was direct? Um, so I think in this case the answer is probably no, and this is because I showed you that the network really doesn't flow relative to the uh, to the substrate, so it's really uh, stuck to the substrate. I think here I would probably say that it more allows the cells to be dynamic and kind of you know change and, and react uh, uh, mm -hmm. to things, maybe similar to the, to a spindle, uh, but I don't think it's here used to generate force more force. Right. Uh I have a question. question. Oh, sorry, Dan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, uh, very nice, Kenrad. Um, a, a question about that uh, 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 issue of whether the monomers are adding from solution or from a surface. What kind of experiments do you think would be able to address that in live cells? I think that's a really difficult question because you really need to, I mean, that's really at the leading edge. Um, I, I, I mean, it's. I think it's really, um, Difficult. If if there were ways to you know to have things being labeled when they're at the membrane, like specifically fluoresce when they're at the membrane or something, that might be a, a very helpful tool. But it's uh, I don't know, very tricky. I mean, to me, it's shocking how little we know about what's actually going on at the leading edge of a of, of a motile cell. Again, at this best studied example. Yep. Thank you. I think just just kind of jump in a little bit there. That's kind of the motivation, at least for what in, in, in vitro things of scheme of things, where there's so much acting everywhere in cells. Unlike microtubules, where you can actually see individual microtubules doing their thing, that you have to kind of. So so far, we are limited to be only being in vitro. Then actually ask those questions uh, in vivo, which would be the holy grail, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, can I add another question from the audience here? From uh, two people have asked this question. David Lin and another person who asked uh, the same question. How do you set the direction of motility? Why isn't just you know happening everywhere? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, uh, in general, um, you could I mean you could ask, um, is it directed from something external, or you could look at just spontaneous uh, uh, symmetry breaking in the cell. If you look at spontaneous symmetry in, 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 in the cell, basically the idea is that the um, the network itself, the structure of the network, uh, allows it to um, gives you some polarity. So we have a polymerization, and then you have membrane tension as kind of a global inhibitor. And if your polymeriz if your polymerization, there's some local activation where uh, uh, that can uh, set off uh, um, kind of a stable polar uh, single uh, leading edge. Then on top of that, you can always have external signals that will uh, direct it. But but in these cells, it's been nicely shown that you can have a, a single amelopodium. But it also depends on the property. So you can, uh, for example, there. Experiments from the Terriot lab where you um, uh, play with the myosin and you can get multiple amelopodia uh, in a single cell rather than one. Okay, so the, the next question is from Yane. He says, uh, what would we need to declare victory on the question of what determines cell speed? What's missing? I hope you don't declare victory too soon, but yes, that's the question. Um, I mean, to me, I think we need to know more about what's the, what, like what's going on at the leading edge and what the, the different subpopulations are uh, are doing there. Because we really, I mean, we have, you know, we know a lot of things that can influence the subpopulations and make them. I mean, you're, you're, you have a simplified experiment of that. If you put a formin or a capping protein in solution, you can change the polymerization rate, in your case, with constant, basically, actin concentration in, in uh uh, solution. So it's both um, being able to say better what's actually going on at the leading edge and also experimentally, I mean, the, the, the quantification, which we worked very hard to do, gave us kind of a coarse view of, of this. So we can say what's in the network, what's getting out of the network, what's in the monomer population, but what's relevant for understanding cell speed is what are these different subpopulations of monomers. And there we don't have experimental tools to distinguish between them in, in live cells. So, I mean, I think either uh, advances experimentally or um, enough insight from in vitro combined with extra steps experimentally so that you can uh, uh, match these uh, numbers. Absolutely. And the overall thing is you have a lot of actin there, right? You have millimolars of actin, so you have to understand how it's controlled. No, absolutely. I think that's one of the things we've, me and Kenneth have talked about early, at an early point to, to be able to kind of maybe at some point go with the cell extract system. We can actually take out whatever's inside a cell and flow that on actin filaments that we made in vitro. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully from the mm -hmm. from the growth weight, you can get some handle on what's, yeah. what's going on inside. But that's against, there's a, too many ifs and buts in there. The other question we had from was from Hishika Rai. And she said, uh, does the polymerization from a surface have an extra advantage? 
so for, for sure, I mean, the, the, the most obvious advantage is that you can actually polymerize much faster than you would if you didn't have this intermediate step. So basically you're kind of loading the membrane. If you have a lot of these uh, surface bound monomers, you can, uh, and this uh, was shown by, by Dyke's lab, you can polymerize a few times faster than what you would just from a, a, a solution. It could also have some buffering effect as well. Okay, so we have one last question there from uh, Martin Sweatman, and he said, uh, why are actin clusters that form the filaments apparently spherical? What sets the spherical diameter? I'm not sure I'm I not understand. Clear. I, 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 my understanding, I think is those were just kind of, kind of cartoons I would imagine, I, I would think, and that's why it looks looks that way. That'd be my, my take on that. Okay, I, I'm not sure I, I understand the question, so I can't answer it. Okay, so I think we are pretty close to time on this one, and so we can actually move on to our next talk. And that's going to be from Maria Zanich who's now a professor in uh, cell and developmental biology at Vanderbilt University. She came in from a very different field in a, in a grad, grad school from UT Austin and then jumped, uh, went, jumped the ocean and went to Joe Howard's lab at Max Planck in Dresden. Uh, after which she set up her lab at Vanderbilt and she's been she's interested really in uh, molecular mechanisms that control microtubule dynamics. And that's kind of very close to my heart because those are many questions that we are interested in and in, in the actin cytoskeleton. So go ahead, Maria. And just as one little small uh, uh, addition to the program uh, right now, we will not have a break and we'll continue immediately afterwards with uh, Dan Fletcher's talk. So go ahead, Maria. So the first question is, am I sharing the correct screen? So let me, do you see the presenter view or the slides? We slides. see the slides, yeah. Slides. You see the, a single slide? Yeah. Excellent, okay. All right, well, um, and let me move this as well. All right, uh, well, first I would like to, of course, um, thank the um, organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, very exciting um, uh, workshop. Um, and so I guess I'm here to speak for the microtubules. Uh, so my lab um, is studying um, the dynamics and regulation of uh, microtubule cytoskeleton. And following these last two talks, I think my goal, my new goal for this talk is to show you that microtubules are just as exciting, if, if not more, um, as, as actin filaments. So if we look at the, all of these different um, cellular processes that microtubules are involved in, um, one thing that becomes clear is that we see that individual microtubules display really a variety of lengths and turnover rates in, in different cellular contexts. Um, and even within a single cell, so for example, in the context of a dividing cells, you will have subpopulation of microtubules that have different lengths and different uh, turnover rates. And so the problem of control of microtubule size is really essential for microtubule function um, in cells. And so what I decided since this is a very short talk is to focus on a one very specific example that we became um, really interested in um, recently um, in, in my lab. And I think it's a, it's a really uh, elucidates how microtubule length can be controlled and regulated. And that example is actually microtubule treadmilling. Um, so um, this is a movie that was made in Claire Waterman's lab almost 20 years ago. And what we see are individual microtubules that have two free ends and using speckle microscopy, what um, the authors were able to show that these microtubules are actually polymerizing at one polymer end and simultaneously depolymerizing at the opposite end. And of course, this is called treadmilling. Now, we've already heard about treadmilling in the context of actin, and we know that tre actin treadmilling is essential for actin-based cell motility. But uh, microtubule treadmilling is actually quite unusual and surprising. And the reason for that is that the hallmark behavior of microtubules is uh, so-called dynamic instability. So here's a turf movie. And, and again, you know, uh, thanks to Shashank for um, introducing um, um, this technique, showing a population of microtubules that are polymerized with purifying tubule in, in vitro. And if we focus on any one of these uh, microtubules, and I apologize that my chymographs are going with time in the vertical direction, which is a convention in our field. So length is horizontal and time is vertical. So uh, what you will see is that each of these microtubules at each, each of its ends is switching th from through well-defined phases of growth and shrinkage through these processes that are called catastrophe and rescue. 
And so this is a non-equilibrium polymer behavior, and it re requires a consumption of energy from GTP hydrolysis. And what is remarkable really about this behavior that all of these individual microtubules are exposed to the exactly the same environmental co conditions, right? They all see the same tubulin concentration, yet some of them are at any given moment uh, in time, some of them are growing and the others are shrinking and there's this stochastic switching behavior. So the question that we really became interested in is how can the cell tune this stochastic um, independent behavior of microtubule ends um, known as dynamic instability to achieve sustained polymerization, one microtubule end and simultaneous depolymerization, depolymerization and the other microtubule end, which is treadmilling. So in my lab, this question directly translates to a question, can we reconstitute cellular-like microtubule treadmilling with the minimal component system um, in vitro? So where do we start? Uh, well, we typically start with tubulin alone. And um, commonly, dynamic instability is parameterized by just four parameters. And those are the growth and shrinkage rates and the transition frequencies, so catastrophe frequency and rescue frequency. And so in our in vitro system, we can control tubulin concentration very well. So we can do the, uh, you know, we can characterize dynamic instability of microtubule ends uh, over um, a range of tubulin concentration. And we can do it at both microtubule ends. And you will appreciate that minus ends have different dynamics than plus ends. And this has been a subject of a recent study from my lab. So I will point you to that if you're interested in, in, in the minus end. But for the purposes of this talk, we're really interested in overall behavior of the end. Will a given end at a given tubulin concentration overall uh, be growing, polymerizing, or depolymerizing? And so for that, um, the quantity that is really relevant um, in this context is something that has been named uh, tubulin subunit flux. So again, if you imagine that this is a, a micro dynamic microtubule end, and again, time is in the vertical direction. So we have a phase of growth. Uh, first, and a microtubule grows for a certain length, and then we have another phase of shrinkage, and it, there is a polymer length is being lost, and then again we grow and we shrink and so on. So over the course of time, there will be a net assembly rate in this case, right? So over the course of time, this particular end has gained a certain amount of length. And this net assembly rate can be expressed in terms of the parameters that we measure, the population level parameters, the, so the growth shrinkage rates and the risk and catastrophe frequencies. And so we can calculate um, this flux, this net assembly disassembly rate, as a function of tubulin concentration at both microtubule ends. And so we see that at higher tubulin concentrations, on average, both microtubule ends will grow. But then there is a regime where we see that minus ends have a uh, positive fluxes. So on average, they're growing. But at low enough concentrations, the plus ends actually are starting to dip to negative flux rate. So we accept that uh, we expect that on average, they will be disassembling. So this is a regime that in principle is conducive to treadmilling, right? So we have positive flux at one end and negative flux at the other end. But this is a population level, uh, level measurements. And so we wanted to actually look carefully into what individual microtubules do in this regime. And so to do that, we had to modify slightly our um, in vitro assay. So now we no longer have stabilized seeds. So these are just different colors, but the entire microtubule is dynamic and can, fall, can depolymerize. And so what we see, if we observe individual microtubules over the course of about 30 minutes, uh, we can, uh, in principle, classify individual microtubules into four different behaviors, depending on what their flux is at each of the ends. So we can either have both ends shrinking, or we can have one of the ends on average growing and the other one shrinking. So that will be treadmilling, either minus end or plus end leading, or both ends growing. And if we characterize the fluxes at each of these ends for each of these microtubules, we see that as expected, um, minus ends have positive flux. It is fairly small flux. Plus ends show a variety of fluxes such that this categorization, basically we can see that about half of our microtubule population can be in principle classified as treadmilling. And the vast majority of them are minus end leading. Okay, so, so what I'm telling you is that in principle, treadmilling with tubulin alone is possible. But of course, this treadmilling looks nothing like treadmilling that has been observed in cells. Um, in cells, the typical flux rates of treadmilling are in tens of nanometers per second, and they're always plus and directed. 
And so then how can the cell achieve this type of treadmilling? Well, of course, you already know the answer to that. There are myriad, really many, many microtubule associated proteins that will regulate the behavior of microtubules inside of cells. And some of them will specifically regulate uh, microtubule dynamics at microtubule ends. And we and many other labs have characterized the properties of individual proteins uh, and have a pretty good idea what some of them can do. So in order to figure out how uh, we can fine tune microtubule dynamics to achieve a treadmilling regime, what we decided to do is to use computational simulations uh, and basically in our in silico assay, add individual components. So very much in the spirit of the talk that we heard from, from Li Xi and Xiaxiang, um, to, to try to um, predict and identify regimes that will be conducive to treadmilling. And so our input parameters are growth and shrinkage rates and catastrophe and rescue frequencies um, that we have an idea of from in measurements with individual components. And then we just model stochastic switching between phases of growth and shrinkage. So where do we start? Well, first, what we want to do is achieve a fast growth rate at the plus end, because remember, cellular microtubules have very large plus end fluxes. So we know, luckily, how to do that, because we have previously shown that a combination of two proteins, a microtubule polymerase XMAP215 and end binding protein EB1, can lead to a really striking 30-fold increase in microtubule plus end growth rates. So now we simulate, we add uh, these two proteins in our in silico assay. And so this is a seedless assay, so microtubules can depolymerize completely. And this is indeed what happens. So what we see is that even though we are achieving these very fast plus and growth rates, when catastrophe happens, microtubules depolymerize. And in the end, we actually end up with a large and negative flux at the plus end. So clearly what we're missing, what we need is a component that will uh, prevent depolymerization. So when catastrophe happens, we need something that will rescue that plus end. And we also have a candidate for that because we have recently uh, investigate a protein called CLASP2. And we have shown that in vitro, uh, CLASP2 is a very strong promoter of plus end rescue. So if we add CLASP2 in our in silico assay, what we see now that every time catastrophe happens, it is very quickly rescued. So now we're having this sustained fast uh, uh, and large positive flux at the plus end. So basically the plus ends are now, now behaving exactly like we want them to behave. We still, however, have not achieved treadmilling, right? Because our minus ends are fairly stable and they're on average growing. So what we need to do is we need to add a minus end depolymerase. And for that, we turn to a protein called MCAC. So this is a kinesin-13 mo motor that is well-known uh, catastrophe factor. And MCAC actually turns out to be a, a catastrophe factor at both microtubule plus end and microtubule minus end. But recent studies um, have shown that the presence of CLASP at the microtubule plus end prevents MCAX action at the plus end. So we can simulate MCAX action at the minus end only, and this is what we do. And when we do that, we see now, and I hope that these movies are, are playing okay, um, uh, we can see that we have now achieved uh, tuning of dynamic instability in such a way that we have a sustained, um, fast, uh, plus end fluxes, as well as a large uh, negative uh, minus end fluxes. So this is exactly what we were trying to, to, to um, achieve. And so now that we have this computational prediction, we can go ahead and do the experiments because fortunately we have all of these proteins um, expressed and purified. Um, and so you can see these examples that when we add these four components into our in vitro assay, we see robust microtubule treadmilling. And here's just an example of a simulated chymograph and in vitro reconstitution chymograph. And so not only have we gone from, you know, where we had a tubulin alone, where these very low fluxes, and then in both in silico and in vitro, we have uh, large fluxes. We also see that the vast majority of our both in silico and in vitro microtubules are actually exhibiting this plus end leading um, treadmilling. Um, and so basically, um, you know, the, the, to conclude this talk, what I've shown you in the last few minutes, hopefully, is that with just four um, microtubule associated proteins, 
uh, we can really dramatically control and change the behavior of individual uh, microtubules to go from this, you know, stochastic switching um, um, at the both ends to this synchronized um, treadmilling. And of course, these are just four proteins. And we already, you know, people have mentioned that there are proteins that regulate microtubule lattice behavior. There is tubule and code. There are many different components. More is different. Right, we all know that. And so I think, and then the other aspect of, of this problem is that really dynamic architecture of the microtubule cytoskeleton, I think is a problem of many scales. And both we and many other labs are trying to attack this problem from a single molecule level to the level of really microtubule assemblies. And uh, you know, it is my, my strong belief, and I think many others in this audience, that through a combination of um, in, re in vitro reconstitution experiments and computational um, and phys biophysical approaches, we will reach the goal, which is to obtain fundamental understanding of how cells engineer large-scale dynamic cytoskeletal structures essential for life. And so with that, I want to really thank two of really fantastic postdocs in, in, in my lab who have done this work, uh, Gokar Arpag, who is a computational uh, biophysicist and Beth Lawrence, who is a cell biologist and biochemist. So for the younger PIs, when your lab's grow enough, you'll be able to do it all in your, in your own lab, hopefully. Um, uh, and um, of course, the rest of my lab, um, our colleagues who have provided a lot of advice and feedback and reagents and all of our funding sources. And I would like to thank everyone for, for your attention and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Maria, for this wonderful talk and kind of bringing out the parallels between different cytoskeletal systems. And I do agree that microtubules are at least as important as actin. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if anybody has questions on the, on the panel uh, right now, we'll go with that first. And then I have a couple of questions and we can move on to the audience. And please keep your questions coming in into the YouTube chat. And we are taking questions from there uh, as we go. Somebody in the audience has a question, please. I'm oh, sorry, in the panel, please jump in. Maria, I, I have a question. I'm, I'm a beautiful talk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I might have missed this at the beginning, but I guess I wasn't with, with microtubules alone. I was expecting plus end treadmilling, if anything. But so how do you get minus end? I, I, I guess I missed the rationale. I, I see the data, but um, but why why is that? Uh -huh. That's not what I would have predicted. I think that is a, a like a very common and very excellent uh, point that you bring up. And so let me see if I can, yeah. So the reason, it, you know, why we think that, uh, you know, plot, plus ends is where, the, where all the action is, is because they're actually more dynamic. But because they are more dynamic, right? So the, the, the mean length will be defined through both, not just the growth phase, but also shrinkage phase. And so minus ends are sort of like, a, you know, like they're slow and they're more persistent and they will actually, you know, often achieve over greater times, they will achieve greater lengths because they're less dynamic. Um, and so it is the combination of the four parameters that really ends up giving you the mean length of a polymer over time, right? Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, counterintuitive, but thank you. Uh, any other questions from the panel itself? Uh, so I have a question from Maria. That was a beautiful talk, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. so, so the approach that you have is that you add uh, these various components uh, and then try to like this bottom up approach, right? basically going from uh, these few components to many components. Then, then the question is like when it becomes really you add in more and more proteins uh, in terms of the setting up these simulations, like you'll have many parameters, like how do you really make sense of uh, the various aspects or, or, or the features of the data, like in terms of the underlying like principles or what which what are the mechanisms? Like how do you really uh, understand it? Because if, if it's become if, if it becomes too complicated in, in, in terms of the number of molecules, then this is something I, I wonder if you yeah. have any I think that's an excellent question. And you know, and and I think that um, there's a lot of um, subtleties in this, right? So first uh, for individual components, what we have, you know, what we're modeling here is sort of at a mesoscopic level because we're really not uh, looking at underlying kinetics at this level, right? So we're just uh, using these four parameters, growth and shrinkage, catastrophe and rescue as our input parameters. And we have done uh, titrations of individual tubulins. So like, I know, you know, how much, if I add this much of this component, what will happen with respect to growth rate or shrinkage rate or catastrophe and rescue frequency. So we model these as fold effects. 
However, what's really interesting and what is not, you know, captured by design of the model is that there are a lot of synergistic effects of proteins, you know, and so this is what I was trying to point out when we say more is different. So, for example, EB1 and XMAP215 uh, together work synergistically and we don't have, you know, just a purely additive effect. And luckily we know about uh, these synergistic effects because we have, you know, done some combinations of proteins and we took them into account uh, in our simulations because we know how pairs of proteins will 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 um, behave together and what are their you know um, um, outcomes but i think you're absolutely right that it you know the complexity of the system is uh, really exciting and challenging and you know as you add more components there are emergent behaviors that you might um, expect to happen and you don't really know what you're up against and so i think that that's one of the challenges um, of understanding the, the whole system. There's one question from the audience that says, what role does microtubule treadmilling play in cells? So what kind yeah. of processes? That's a huge question. So, Of course. The only so, you know, so, you know, for the purposes of this talk, um, what I want to say is that to me, the ability to control the microtubule, um, um, you know, polymers in different ways is really what, what excited me to in this work. But that's not to say that microtubule treadmilling is not a real thing that actually happens and has a function in cells. And so it has actually been over the years um, observed in many different contexts. So one of the, you, I, can you see this slide um, with cellular contacts? So one of the well-known contacts from, from many years ago is in fish melanophore fragments, where it was proposed that it's a mechanism for microtubule, uh, uh, for tubule and turnover. Right, so you, you can imagine that that uh, makes sense. We know that microtubule treadmilling actually is playing important roles in the um, ne network reorganization in plant cells in cortical arrays. So that has also uh, been shown. And I think another example that we can think about is, um, you know, within the spindle. And there, there is some debate. Uh, so there is something called pulvered flux in the spindle, right? So like if you mark a part of the spindle, you see that there is uh, basically uh, polymerization at the plus end and depolymerization at the minus end. This, uh, to what extent this may uh, contribute to the turnover in the spindle, I think you know there are many mechanisms that are responsible for polar flux and, and, and motors and so on. But at least in principle, if you think about a mechanism that will allow you to keep a steady state length of a structure that is dynamic, it's like, like a spindle, I think that's very appealing. And obviously that's how actin uses thread milling. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks so much for the wonderful talk and answering the questions. And uh, now we can, if you can stop sharing your screen, Maria, I can, thank you. I can go with my share. And I think what I'm gonna quickly, before we move on to the next, we're, we're not gonna take a break right now because we've already kind of lost a little bit of time uh, in, the, in the beginning. So we'll continue with the next talk. But before I introduce the next speaker, I have to share with you, uh, happy to share with you the next uh, program, next uh, workshop on this particular MRE TMLS series, which is gonna be on the, what could be, what could neural dynamics have to say about neutral neuro competitions and do we know how to listen? And this is going to be organized by Chetan Andrinath, who's at Emory and Georgia Tech. And this is going to happen in December, on December 4th at, at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. So please keep an eye on the invitation coming in the next couple of days. And you'll, you know, we would love to have you, all of you listening and back again uh, on this one, on this particular meeting. With that in mind, I'm going to start now. Uh, you've heard a lot of cytoskeleton talks so far, actin microtubules because we're gonna start zooming out a little bit and we're gonna go, we're gonna zoom out all the way as high as we can go. We can go and we're gonna, we're gonna start with uh, working on cells. We're gonna look at organelles with uh, cells with Dan Fletcher, organelles with uh, Stephanie. And then we'll start zooming out with uh, Ken and Carl where we go with um, into the marine biophysi biophysics and the marine ecosystems and then look at plants. So things are gonna get bigger and bigger. So please hang on and keep, keep uh, staying on the same, on the same stream. And first, we, we next move on with uh, the talk of Dan Fletcher, who is uh, a professor at UC Berkeley. And he's, he's a professor in uh, bioengineering. And he's, he holds the Purnendu Chatterjee Chair in Engineering Biological Systems. He was a graduate student at, Har at, at Stanford, after which he trained in the lab of Julie Theriot. And he's primarily interested in mechanical regulation of uh, cellular processes using novel biophysical tools. And with that, I would give the floor to Dan. And to keep the questions coming in, in the YouTube live, we're keeping an eye on that. 
Great. Um, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed the, the previous talks. Uh, so we are going to step out a little bit. Um, I won't be talking about uh, cytoskeletal polymers, but I will be talking about po polymers that are just outside the cell. And these are polymers that are bound to the cell surface, um, or uh, uh, really just they're transmembrane proteins, typically. Um, and uh, I'm talking about the cell surface. Now, the, the reason I want to talk about the cell surface is because I think there's a really interesting question having to do with size on the cell surface, <clears throat> and that is specifically the size of the ectodomains of proteins on the cell surface. So uh, the cell surface, if you uh, do a quick Google search for plasma membrane, <clears throat> you might come up with an image like this. Um, and this is accurate in some ways. Um, uh, it's inaccurate in other ways. And one of the things that it's missing most is... Uh, the diversity um, and density of cell surface proteins. Um, rather than uh, proteins simply being transmembrane, uh, plasma membrane is decorated with a broad set of proteins of different sizes. They can range from uh, a nanometer to hundreds of nanometers. Uh, densities can be on the scale of uh, 20 to 30,000 uh, per uh, square micron. And the, the genome, at least the human genome, has about 3,000 different uh, cell surface proteins um, present. Uh, so cells, each cell type can select from that as they um, uh, define their own cell surface. So we know already um, simply from structural studies or from thinking about the domains that make up uh, extracellular proteins that, uh, that there's a, a wide variety of different sizes. Um, and you can see a few of those proteins that you would find on the surface of, uh, of a macrophage um, right here. They range from single domain proteins like CD47 to multi-domain proteins like this uh, complement receptor on the end. We, we also know, um, even prior to the structural work, um, a simply electron microscopy of cell surfaces um, shows a fuzzy boundary all around them. Um, and that fuzzy boundary, uh, the glycocalyx, uh, is, uh, is exactly this, um, a diverse set of proteins often post-translationally modified um, with glycans uh, that create this fuzzy um, uh, barrier um, between cells. So the question I wanna ask, and I won't give an answer to it because I don't know the answer, um, but I wanna uh, ask the question about uh, what's the role for this diverse set of uh, sizes? And are there situations where this size diversity um, can play a role? Um, now, one other way to look at the, um, uh, the, the diversity is to um, first use computational tools. Um, and so a um, postdoc, uh, Caden Southard, um, took on the challenge of uh, looking at the entire uh, human proteome and making a prediction based on homology modeling of how tall should the different proteins be. Um, and so this is what that size distribution looks like. Um, and it's a it's a quite a strange distribution. I don't know really know what I was expecting. Um, but what you notice straight away is that there are a number of different peaks and valleys. There's some uh, sizes where you see a high number of proteins at that size, um, and then there'll be few, and then peaks and, and, and valleys. And some of those have to do with uh, um, how many domains does this uh, protein have? Does it have two, three, four, five, or more? Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting set of, uh, of proteins. And the question really is, why are they like this? Why are they, are, why are they these different sizes? Now, the, the way in which um, I have been thinking about cell surface proteins um, in general have been in the context of specific interactions. So when we think of cell surfaces and we think of cell-cell contacts, we tend to, to, to think about uh, a very pairwise um, uh, interactions. So this molecule binds to that across the cell surface. Um, but we tend to forget that there are thousands of other species also present at those interfaces, and uh, they have a diverse uh, set of sizes, and what effect um, are those having? Now, this is a, a question that's actually been treated theoretically um, for a number of years, going way back to the uh, Bell model of uh, binding. Um, the concept of uh, distance and, um, and affinity is something that has been explored uh, theoretically. And in the case where you have two surfaces um, separated by some distance, um, if the, the ideal resting length of a, of a, a molecular interaction is extended um, you know, by five nanometers in one case, 
you you re you reduce the on rate um, by a factor of twenty. So the actual spacing that two surfaces make and the the receptor and ligand um, or two adhesion molecules, their ability to interact depends very strongly on a nanometer scale um, of how far apart those uh, those surfaces are. Now this uh, this concept that that size could play a role is something that um, has has been introduced a number of years ago, 30 years ago, in fact, um, Tim Springer had a, had a, a prescient review in, in Nature where he noted that uh, a number of proteins involved in uh, immune synapse formation have diverse sizes, or at least just based on, on, on their structure, they should be uh, different heights. I um, mean, this uh, suggested that there must be different gaps or different separations between membranes at cell-cell contacts. Um, and this was made very explicit in um, a, a, a model that was proposed by Anton Davis and, uh, and Anton Vandermeer, sorry, Simon Davis and Anton Vandermeer uh, back in 1996, um, where they uh, suggested that um, exclusion of a tall protein was actually essential for signaling from uh, the T cell, um, T cell receptor. And this, this model, um, many aspects of this model have, have proven uh, to be the case. So the, the, the mechanism um, of signaling involves um, reliance on different sized uh, cell surface proteins. Um, so we got interested in this a few years ago, thinking about um, in vitro systems and whether we could identify what size really matters um, for exclusion. How, how exclusive can a membrane be just by itself without uh, the help of the cytoskeleton, um, simply a, a, a bilayer membrane? How, how much could it drive exclusion? And what we found was uh, that uh, approximately a five nanometer difference in the size of synthetic proteins placed on a, um, a, a giant vesicle and allowed to adhere um, a five nanometer difference between a non-binding protein and the gap created by binding proteins was enough to drive pretty significant exclusion uh, from that interface. So uh, assuming mobility of the proteins and assuming that the membrane itself is the only uh, penalty for, uh, introduces the only penalty for being in the gap, five nanometers was enough to, to kick it out. Um, this got us interested in, in um, um, where other uh, cells might uh, use size uh, to define what they do. Um, and we were interested in phagocytosis and so looked into um, that uh, um, situation. Now in phagocytosis, you have a uh, uh, macrophage that uh, has to recognize and then, um, uh, and then decide what, what to do about a particle. And in this case, it's a red blood cell that's um, got antibodies on it. And so the, the uh, macrophage uses an FC receptor that can bind to an antibody and then triggers phagocytosis. Um, and the mechanism responsible for, for triggering um, was something that we wanted to explore. The way we explored it was using a, a hybrid semi-synthetic system. So one in which we had total control over the targets. Um, so we made a glass bead, coated it with a lipid bilayer, um, engineered proteins of different heights, um, all with uh, an epitope at the end that we could uh, attach the same exact antibody to. So a macrophage um, was seeing uh, one antibody, but that antibody was presented at different heights above the surface of this particle, simply because we engineered proteins, fibronectin domain uh, repeats, that um, extended the, the antibody different sizes from the surface. Um, and what we found, um, interestingly, was that um, uh, even though you have a fully decorated bead with antibodies, if that antibody is presented on a molecule that is tall um, uh, versus one that is short, the tall uh, uh, molecule will not be phagocytosed or will not trigger um, phagocytic signaling. And the mechanism for this uh, turns out to be very similar to the one identified in T cells. Um, that is, there's a phosphatase um, that has a very tall ectodomain, CD45, um, and if that uh, CD45 is allowed to be next to the receptor, um, it will turn off phosphorylation. It will dephosphorylate the receptor, and so there will be no downstream signaling. Um, but if that tall phosphatase is physically, sterically excluded from the interface, then it's not able to turn off the receptor, and the downstream signaling uh, will take place. And what that says is that antibodies, which we know can be raised uh, against epitopes on various parts of extracellular proteins, um, it suggests that they're only going to be effective at driving phagocytosis if they're targeting 
uh, short molecules, not long molecules. Now this effect of size um, is, uh, the short is better, um, but again, there are many long molecules around uh, those short molecules. Uh, so what happens if you crowd this uh, surface with tall molecules that uh, potentially could obscure access um, or binding of the receptor to the antibody? And so um, graduate student Ari has been looking into this and it's clear that if we add synthetic proteins at a sufficient lateral density um, or of a sufficient height, that we can block access to the antibody. So being short is effective for uh, generating uh, the exclusion of the in inhibitor, but it will uh, potentially allow you to be blocked by surrounding proteins. Um, so there's a competition between what's better. Do you wanna be short or do you wanna be tall? Uh, and that problem is even uh, more uh, severe in the context of, uh, of uh, pathogens that want to get into cells. Um, they don't necessarily uh, know a lot about the cell that they're uh, um, uh, trying to get into. Um, and in many cases, if they want to fuse or uh, drive cell-cell uh, um, contacts, um, as in the case of a, a reptilian rheovirus uh, that uh, student Carmen Chan um, explored, uh, this has a fusogen that is very short. Uh, now, many fusogens uh, for influenza, for uh, some cell-cell fusion events, all have relatively tall ectodomains, maybe about 10 nanometers. And then when they um, uh, unfold and insert a fusion peptide, they're, they're taller still. And so that allows them uh, to bridge a gap that is filled by tall proteins. Um, but what, what does a, a virus that expresses a, uh, a fusogen that has an ectodomain that's only about a nanometer tall? Uh, well, it just so happens that this virus has figured out how to hijack the actin cytoskeleton to generate the forces um, that we think are necessary to push that fusogenic ectodomain into contact with the opposing membrane. So it's not tall enough on itself, so it needs to recruit some help internally to generate the contact uh, to fuse. Now, all this uh, uh, talk about heights uh, um, uh, have, have been so far uh, estimated um, from structures, and um, there are some uh, you know, EM methods for measuring height, but it can be challenging to, to really know how tall is the protein that we're, that we're thinking about. Um, so we've recently uh, put together a, a method for measuring the heights of proteins um, that can be used for purified proteins as well as proteins on native membranes. I mean, it essentially uses um, a super resolution localization approach, but we just do it twice, uh, once at the base and once at the tip. And if you know, uh, if you give up um, uh, your X, Y information and you only care about the height of a protein, then you can average, you've got lots of photons and so you could localize really uh, precisely. Um, and so testing this out with double-stranded DNA, which we can, many models have predicted how tall they should be, um, we can make measurements that are very accurate um, uh, on a nanometer scale of the height. And we can use this to explore um, how tall are proteins of different sizes. So these are the synthetic proteins that we used uh, to control the activation of macrophages. Um, but these, uh, uh, this, this approach we've also used for um, uh, native proteins, um, and it can be used to figure out where antibodies are on, on molecules as well as where glycans are. And the concept is simply you average the location of uh, a fluorescent uh, marker, uh, whether it's engineered or added through an antibody, and then based on that, uh, on that measurement, you get a, a size. And then if you, can, if you do some modeling to estimate um, what is the flexibility of the protein uh, that um, that gave you this height, given the number of domains that it has, you can back out a, a bending rigidity for the protein as well. And so this allows us to, to, to now quantify uh, different aspects of uh, cell surface protein heights. Um, so I'll end just by returning to this, uh, this plot that Caden prepared. Um, and, and what we're puzzled about and interested in learning more about is why is this distribution the way it is? Um, what are the, the, the pressures that drive a protein to be taller or shorter? Um, what are the, the, the gaps created by cell-cell contacts? How, how does that contribute to the spatial organization of the proteins at that interface? Um, and so uh, uh, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, I'll thank the students that uh, did uh, uh, tremendous work to, um, to explore this, this new area for us, uh, in particular, uh, Matt Bacalar and Eva Schmidt, 
um, and I showed you work from Carmen Chan and Sungman Son, um, as well as Caden Southern. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dan, uh, for this great talk. And yeah, if, if there are any people in the in the panel who have any questions, please go ahead, jump in. I have, I have a question. If you look at all the single cell sequencing data that's coming out now or, or, or things like that, and then look at, at, at sort of the express proteome in various cells, and then you go back and then, and then use that map of the height, do you see that there are different cells that sort of have a higher average protein height overall? Yes, that's a, that's exactly what Caden's been uh, been doing now. Um, and uh, so he's starting to see some some differences, even in subtypes of cells. So some immune cell uh, subtypes um, have uh, slight differences. Maybe the average is you know ten nanometers or so, um, uh, but there are slight differences. And the, but then you look at a neuron, and it's uh, dramatically different. Um, so so I think there are going to be groups of cells that have different average heights. But but one question is whether the average is is the right you know, is the right metric for comparison? Or is it, you know, some uh, extremes that are that are going to be most interesting? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, but a great, great question. So I think maybe just to follow up directly on that, in your last data slide that you showed, there looked like to be a particular height that was sort of standing out. Um, um, so is yeah, there, uh, let me go special? back to that. You know, it was uh, at a... So this 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 slide. You know, so there's there's a sharp sort of um, extreme in, in your distribution at around I guess a couple of nanometers, right? So, uh, yeah. So so what's special about that? That yeah. So there are there are lots of um, um, uh, multi-pass proteins um, that have uh, uh, we only count one one loop or one um, you know n terminal domain uh, for each of those. So there are, I think what that tells us is there are lots of proteins that kind of look like um, that Google image uh, that I showed where they're just peeking above the membrane. Um, and those are gonna be all sorts of channels, um, uh, you know, multi-pass uh, um, receptors. Um, what constitute these, these other peaks um, really tend to be um, single domain, uh, which is what that next peak around five, you know, four or five nanometers. Uh, then uh, two domains, uh, and then you'll see another peak maybe around 30, um, which is interesting as well. And that's, um, you know, uh, uh, we're looking into exactly what uh, comprises each of these, but um, there's lots that are, that are short, uh, but also a, a healthy number that, that create an average of, you know, around 10 for some, uh, for some cell types. Dan, actually, I have a question following up on what Maria, the same exact slide. If I'm looking at the tail, the tail seems to have a non-zero number even after 100 nanometers. What are these molecules? And they, especially if you are, as you go further along, these are massive in terms of scale of size that you're talking about. Yeah, kind of it, it, yeah, they're massive. Uh, so uh, typically these really long ones are mucins. Um, uh, and these mucins are, you know, can be enormous. Um, and I, and uh, and I think that's really what the early um, uh, electron microscopy images, you know, taught us is that that on many cell types there can be these really long things um, extending that are appear to be just physical barriers, um, but but are but are clearly playing an important role in 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 driving connections uh, because um, even you know for macrophages which you know have a couple hundred uh, nanometer tall um, complement receptor, you know, being able to, to, to bind to complement, um, to, to trigger an, an, an engagement um, is, is critically important, I guess. Um, and so, so thinking about the sequence of binding events may help us understand some of this distribution of different sizes. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, so I have, uh, we have some questions from the audience uh, on YouTube. One question we have from Navish uh, is, is that if the, if the virus fus fusogen is too short to do its job without the help from cytoskeleton, then what is the advantage of for it being sh too short? Yeah, why would it be short? Um, uh, well, I guess if it's too short, then it wouldn't survive. So, uh, you know, that's, a, that's not a great answer. Um, but the fact that we have viruses, you know, that um, uh, that still have um, short um, uh, fusogens suggests that that they can be successful through other means. 
um, they have some some mechanism to uh, to to get to um, the cell surface. Now, now those that uh, that don't take advantage of the cytoskeleton, as I was showing for this uh, this uh, orthorheovirus, um, those those are the those are the short ones that we're aware of, um, and they're they they have this ability to hijack the cytoskeleton to to make them feel tall. Um, those that don't have that uh, capability, you know, flu, uh, those, those are tall. And so it, um, uh, I, I think we don't yet know about um, short proteins that don't have other uh, means to, to, to achieve that, uh, that fusion. Does it correlate with, with viral genome size? I mean, are, like, are, are, are the viruses that have the short fusion just try to make everything as small as possible? I, really interesting question. I, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, are other for for other real viruses? Are there is their genome um, small? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I don't know. I think Kinnerth has a question uh, to follow up on that. Yeah, so so you're emphasizing the height, but there's also like a dynamic aspect. You have to rearrange, and this is not trivial. And different size proteins may be able to rearrange better or not. Can you say something about that? Yeah, it's a really good point, Kenneth. Um, uh, so I think this is one uh, uh, influence on uh, the overall organization, um, the height and the, the 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 steric effect of that height. But like you said, um, their ability to move um, is critically important. So there's another layer of organizational pressure that can come from the membrane. Um, if the membrane is um, phase separated, or if there are lipid liquid ordered, liquid disordered domains in the membrane, that can influence um, the clustering or organization. And then on top of that, uh, the connection to the cytoskeleton or other structures intracellularly can change their ability to move. Um, so the, the kinetic aspect of it is a, is a really important one. I've, I've kind of presented a very equilibrium perspective, but um, the ability to rearrange and how quickly you can rearrange is, is undoubtedly um, central to the signaling. And that was actually suggested uh, you know, way back in this kinetic segregation model. And the idea was that you had to create these local regions of uh, where you exclude this inhibitory phosphatase. Um, and it didn't have to be very big, just a couple hundred nanometers um, uh, wide was enough to allow for the signaling of the receptor. So, and, and I think that has to do with uh, how quickly can you get these things out um, while you remain bound uh, to, uh, you know, between the T cell receptor and the peptide bound MHC. Thanks. We'll have two more questions. One of them is from the, uh, from the audience again, from Ricky Garner from Stanford. She says, uh, she's asking, she's curious to hear about surface molecule flexibility and membrane flexibility or fluidity. Are there regimes where size exclusion does not happen or no longer happens? Yeah, great question. Um, so, that was part of the motivation for the uh, early uh, giant vesicle experiments that we did um, uh, to try and ask if we just have a membrane and we just have uh, proteins that are his tagged and so therefore quite flexible on the membrane, um, what influence, uh, you know, is, is the pressure to segregate still there? And, and we did see that uh, presumably at some, uh, if we reduce the tension in the membrane enough um, uh, so that the membrane is floppy, uh, then we would remove the driving pressure to exclude protein. So, so I think the answer is yes, there's going to be a regime where height doesn't matter at all, where the flexibility of the membrane can accommodate um, all of the, uh, the height variations or topographical variations on the membrane. Whether, whether that state exists in cells or not, um, I think we don't know. I think uh, the kind of uh, tension measurements that Kinneret has made, I think those are the kinds of measurements that are needed to explore whether you can get into the regime where uh, flexibility doesn't matter. And similarly, uh, you know, I've ignored the cytoskeleton, which is, which is a crime, I know, uh, but the, clearly the cytoskeleton is going to be uh, generating its own uh, topography based on how it pushes on the membrane. And so I think it's a, it's a combination of these. I wanted to highlight the, the potential effect that height of molecules can have. Uh, but clearly, this is layered on many other driving forces uh, that all need to be considered to think about how cell-cell contacts are created. Okay, so the one, one last question we have, and I'm making a probably mistake in reading it. It says, what role do the glycomoieties play in these intercellular interactions? Um, uh, they play, a, 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 I think, a big role. Um, I think in two ways. Um, they can, they're 
Uh, they can fill space. So, so volume exclusion means that they kind of increase the effective uh, um, uh, density of a set of molecules. Um, and second, uh, charge. Um, uh, they add a lot of charge, which changes the kind of interactions that, uh, that the, the proteins are going to have. Um, uh, and I think there's much more to be done to really explore in a more nuanced way um, how different glycans affect uh, both height and the interactions um, with neighboring molecules. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a really interesting direction to, to think about. Thank you, Dan, for, for the great talk. And uh, if, if, if there's still some more questions they can address uh, on YouTube live, that'd be very nice. Uh, and with that, we would uh, move on to our next speaker. That's Stephanie Weber from McGill. And she's a professor, a professor in biology and her lab is interested in phase separation driven assembly of membrane-less organelles that she's gonna talk about today. Before her current position, she was uh, a postdoc with Cliff Franklin at Princeton and a grad student with Julie Terrio. And as I said that, I've kind of realized that there's been two running teams in the workshop today. One of them has been Julie Terrio because a lot of speakers here have been at Julie, Julie's lab. And, that, and incidentally, that was the reason why I came into acting initially, seeing those movies of Listeria and she's kind of the, been a, been a hero of mine personally for, for 15 years almost now. So that's a, kind of a shout out to her. And second is the MBL. And we've had a bit of a connection with MBL too here. So without uh, going further with that, I'll let Stephanie talk about her organelles after which we'll be moving forward with uh, Ken and Carl on the marine biophysics and on plants. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very much a, a Julie fan, but never worked on the cytoskeleton. So I am going to bring, bring other parts of the cell uh, to, to this discussion. So uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about membraneless organelles. Um, and, oh wait, hold on, sorry. There we go. Um, so, uh, so what I'm, my model system is uh, C. elegans. And what I find fascinating is that the cell size changes dramatically over its, throughout its development. So um, in early embryos, the, the cell goes from a really large volume and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it reductively divides within a fixed volume of the eggshell. And then once the cell hatches, uh, once the worm hatches, then it grows hypertrophically. And, and hypertrophic means that um, the number of cells stays relatively constant, but each individual, si each si each individual cell increases in volume. Um, and so this gives us a really interesting um, system to, to look at structures, organelles. So here you can see the nucleus, which is also decreasing in size as the, as the uh, embryo divides, um, of, of how uh, cells can coordinate the size of, of themselves, of the cell, with their internal structures. And so, um, so organelle size scaling is, is, a, is a very popular uh, field, and, and other people have, have studied it for, for a while. Um, and so Sort of two of the best uh, understood systems is, is the mitotic spindle. Um, and here is a, a, an example from Matthew Good in Xenophis embryos, where the spindle is, is really large in, in large cells. And then as the cells divide um, and get smaller, then the spindle lengths get smaller. Um, and the other classic example is, uh, is the nucleus. So this is a membrane bound spherical organelle. And as the cell grows, so this is, um, uh, fission yeast, and, and here the cells are growing, and as the cells grow, then the nucleus also grows. And so I want to, so here we have a, a cytoskeletal example, there you go, um, uh, this one's for Maria, and, um, and a, a membrane-bound organelle. Um, but the other sort of um, distinction I want to draw here is that in the embryonic system, the embryo, at least in the early stages, is just subdividing maternally loaded components. It's not building anything, it's not synthesizing anything new. Um, and, that, and that imposes some, um, some constraints on the system that are, make it much easier to study. Um, but the more interesting, perhaps, uh, system is, is growing systems, right? And so in order for this um, yeast cell to grow its nucleus, it has to synthesize new material as it's growing. And so there's sort of two different regimes of trying to coordinate organelle size with cell size. There's just subdividing um, uh, what already exists, and then they're synthesizing new material, and that creates different challenges for the cell in different stages of, of a life cycle. Um, so uh, you guys have actually already presented uh, this um, uh, background. So, so size control for, for organelles depends on the geometry and on the, the structural details, right? So, so Wallace already introduced a flagella, which is a linear system. So it grows and shrinks at the ends. Um, and, and we have some ideas about how, how that is um, 
uh, controlled. We have the spindle, which is a branch network um, that can grow and shrink by, um, by different um, regulatory factors that nucleate or sever filaments. Um, and this can be controlled by a, a gradient. Um, and then the nucleus is, is membrane bound. And so it is controlled by import or transport, um, import and export across a membrane. And so, um, so these uh, systems have been really well explored. Still a lot of open questions as you guys uh, highlighted. Um, but what I wanted to do is um, focus on these questions in a, in a relatively new uh, type of system, uh, which is biomolecular condensates or membraneless organelles. And, um, and so just as a super brief introduction, um, the idea here is that you have um, a pool of soluble components uh, so this here is fibrillarin, which is a protein in the nucleolus. Um, it, they are dissolved in the nucleoplasm, and then they undergo liquid-liquid phase separation to condense to form these um, droplets that look like uh, liquid droplets, and they don't have a barrier, and yet they still have a um, distinct, con you know, high con local concentration relative to to the background. Um, and so nature and cell press have described these as, as lava lamps. Um, another analogy is, um, you know, liquids uh, can be either mixed. It's lunchtime for me. I don't know about where you guys are, but um, uh, alcohol and water can mix to form a single homogeneous phase and oil and vinegar um, uh, phase separate and demix to form different phases, even though there's no physical membrane uh, between them. So there's no diffusion barrier, but they still remain, remain demixed. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is how um, organelles of, of this structure, um, so mostly spherical, uh, but no membrane, how do they control their size? And so um, if we think about phase separation, uh, we, can, we can draw a phase diagram uh, where we have the concentration of, of the components, so like the green protein that I showed you earlier. And then on the y-axis here, we have temperature or pH or, or whatever control parameter. And so um, by just changing the concentration, we can change the size of the, um, of the organelle. So here at C, it is above what is called a critical or saturation concentration. And so below this critical concentration, you don't get any uh, phase separation. And above it, or in this um, green region, you get phase separation. But as you increase the concentration above the saturation concentration, the size of these condensed phases gets gets larger. Um, and so that is in a fixed um, uh, cell volume. But instead, if we fix the concentration and change the volume, then we see that the um, size of the organelle will scale with the volume of the cell. And so in an embryonic system where the concentration is fixed because the early embryo is just subdividing what mom gave it, it's not synthesizing any new material yet, um, large cells, um, have large nucleoli, and as the cells divide, the nucleoli get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we see a, a robust linear um, scaling between size of the nucleus and the size of the cell, or the nucleus in this case, but the nucleus is proportional to the cell. Um, and so we can get size scaling by fixing the concentration, and the organelle will linearly um, scale with, with the cell volume. OK, um, so that, that is cool. Uh, but as I mentioned, the more interesting uh, scenario is, well, what happens when the cell grows? Um, and so uh, if, we, if we let the um, C. elegans embryo hatch, it goes through th uh, four larval stages before it becomes an adult. And during these larval stages, it exponentially grows. Um, and so if we, if we look at the um, nucleolus in a single tissue, so I'm looking here at the intestine, and we chose the intestine because it grows roughly um, linearly with the, with the whole organism. So the, there are 20 cells in L1 intestine and there are 20 cells in L4. These are just larval stage one, larval stage four. Um, so the, the, the length of the intestine increases with, with the length of the body. And what you can hopefully see is that the size of the nucleoli increases um, with the size of, of the cell. And, and we, can, we can quantify this over multiple um, uh, uh, size scales, and, and we get a robust linear scaling between nucleolar volume and cell volume. And so it, because the, uh, the worms are growing and, and the cells are, are growing, in order to maintain this, um, this scaling, the cell would have to produce an exponentially more uh, amount of material to, to maintain, this, um, maintain this relationship. 
Um, but interestingly, what we also found, um, and I, sh I should mention that this, this work was done by uh, Shravanti Upaluri, um, found that the nucleus scales sublinearly with cell size. So, um, so as the uh, cell grows, the nucleus doesn't keep up, but the nucleolus keeps up. And so this sublinear scaling of the nucleus allows the cell to, or the cell doesn't require making as much stuff to maintain the, um, the scaling of the nucleolus. Um, and so that it could be one way to um, sort of maintain organelle size without, you know, spending so much energy um, just producing enough stuff to maintain a constant volume or a constant concentration. Sorry. Um, Okay, so um, so th that that's cool. We we can we can uh, measure these uh, scaling relationships, um, but the the real question is is so what? And so there's a huge um, not just in the size field, but in in the phase separation field. There's this huge elephant in the room of you know we can describe and and watch this this transition, but there's actually relatively little evidence of, of what the functional consequence of this is yet. And, and I mean, the reason is because it's, it's easy to see this and measure size, but it's really hard to measure function. Um, and so the, the hand-waving uh, explanation is that the function of a membraneless organelle is that it increases the local concentration of enzymes or substrates and so that can accelerate biochemical reactions. Um, and that sounds very plausible. Um, there are still relatively few examples that actually show that, especially in vivo. Um, and then the other possibility is, is the inverse, right? Um, you could sequester and, and um, hold reactants or enzymes and separate them from their, um, from their reaction partners and inhibit activity. Um, and so I was looking at the nucleolus. And so the primary function of the nucleolus is ribosome biogenesis. This is a multi-step process, very complicated. Um, but the first step in the rate limiting step is transcription. And so to start to get at the relationship between nuclear size and nuclear activity, we looked at transcription. And so to measure transcription, we used uh, a method called fluorescence in situ hybridization. And we have a series of um, uh, DNA probes that hybridize to internal transcribed spacers. So these are essentially introns um, in these um, ribosomal uh, uh, DNA. And, uh, and so this will only, um, mark uh, newly synthesized ribosomal RNA. Um, and it, once it's processed, um, then, then we can't see it. So we're looking at nascent transcripts. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, an example of a fish experiment from, uh, from an embryo at the comma stage. Comma isn't particularly important, other than the fact that the embryo at this stage has already started to differentiate. So you can actually see some cells and some tissues have much larger nucleoli and some have much smaller. And so this gives us a, a large dynamic range where we can look at the um, intensity of, of the protein, which is our, our proxy for organelle size. And then we can look at the intensity of the fish signal um, and we get a, um, a linear relationship. So this suggests that the um, size of the nucleus, um, you know, directly um, correlates with the activity or the transcriptional activity. Um, so so that's, that's cool. Um, but there's also the possibility that the um, presence of our RNA serves as a binding site to recruit more fibrillarin, which is a RNA um, uh, binding protein. Uh, and so, so there is, there is a you know, potential for a bi bi-directional feedback loop. Um, and so um, at this stage, in, in the comma stage, the the embryo is, is differentiating. It's definitely actively transcribing. Um, and so it was a little bit hard to compare apples and, and oranges here. And so we, we took a step back um, and looked at a single cell stage um, at which we can control genetically the nuclear concentration of all nuclear components. And so here um, at the same, same cell stage, if we increase the concentration of these components, then the size of the um, nucleus increases, as, as we would expect, and the transcription output also increases. And so from this um, experiment in, in the well-controlled sort of apples to apples, it looks like that the size of the nucleus um, promotes transcription, presumably by concentrating polymerase and, and transcription factors. But, <laughs> um, 
what I haven't shown you so far is, is a movie, right? So I've just shown you snapshots of, of two large nuclei in, in the nucleus. But the truth is, is that there are multiple uh, droplets that, that form that nucleate in, in, the, um, in the cell. So this is a one nucleus over time in a cell cycle. And what you can see is there are dozens of droplets that nucleate, and then two of them grow and become much larger. And, and the difference between the, the two large ones and, and the dozens of smaller ones is the presence of RNA. So if, if we do this fish experiment, um, these two large organelles co-localize with active sites of transcription. So these are at the rDNA loci and all of these other um, uh, droplets are extra nucleolar droplets. So they're not, they do not contain RNA or at least at the level that we can detect it. Um, and then in addition, if we can um, genetically inhibit transcription, now we see these dozens of droplets um, and we don't see this coarsening of, of the two large, um, large ones. So, um, so sorry, just to go back for a second. So the, the nucleoli uh, grow in size very, very quickly um, relative to these small droplets. And then if we inhibit um, transcription, then we only see these small drop, the kinetics of the small droplets. And so this suggests that the um, tr action of transcription, e either the action or the product, um, drives uh, uh, nuclear size. And so we definitely have a, a uh, bi-directional um, feedback going. Um, and then to complicate things even further, if we look at a different stage uh, of embryogenesis, um, then we actually see cases where there is transcription and nucleoli don't assemble. So there is, there is a feedback, but you can have transcription without uh, you know, protein condensation and you can have protein condensation um, that does or does not correlate with, with transcription. So it's a much um, more complicated relationship, I guess, between size and, and activity is, is the message that I wanna get there. Um, and, and it does seem to depend on development as well. Um, and so then the final thing I wanted to say, and this might be inappropriate for this workshop, but size isn't everything. So, so there are a number of features of membraneless organelles. So one is size. Um, another is composition. So the, um, the you know, gene expression profile um, in, in worms changes throughout development. Many of the proteins that undergo, you know, very diff uh, differences in, in expression in, in different larval stages are either nucleolar or involved in Paul one transcription regulation. Um, uh, the nucleolus itself is subcompartmentalized um, and, and different subcompartments uh, seem to have different morphologies in different stages of development, which also could affect function. And then finally, the material properties of these membraneless organelles can change. Um, and so I've shown you uh, very liquid-like spherical um, things that are highly dynamic, but, um, but as the worms age um, and or undergo stress, um, the, the nucleus becomes less spherical, more amorphous, and, and less dynamic. And so that could also affect um, function. And so I, um, my sort of future direction in my lab is trying to understand how um, nuclear size and its activity change throughout development and then how those are related. Um, and so we're looking, we, we're using the worm because it has multiple different sort of stages of, of size and growth control. Um, so if we think about the, the functional output of the nucleus, that is, that is a ribosome. And the um, demand for ribosomes is going to change uh, throughout development. So it'll be relatively low in embryogenesis because mom uh, you know, maternally loaded a whole bunch of ribosomes. Um, it'll increase during larval development. It'll sort of plateau in adulthood. And then um, worms enter this dormant state called dower. Um, and so there they can live for, for months without feeding. Um, and so there that developmental time, uh, demand for ribosomes is gonna be low. And so what we're trying to build is this structure function landscape um, where we have size on one you know, axis, but we could also have material properties or composition um, and then activity in this case would be transcription, but we also are interested in looking at other, um, other steps in this ribosome biogenesis process. But the idea is that um, moving um, a, around on this landscape is going to depend on where you are in your developmental um, stage. And so finally, I'll just leave you with, with a couple open questions for, for the field, not just um, my lab. 
which is how does organelle size relate to function, right? We can measure size and we can obsess about what the exact mechanisms are to control size, but it's not necessarily the biologically relevant um, um, metric. Um, and so um, I'll just I'll just note that the nucleus is, is enlarged in in cancers, presumably because um, they're more uh, have a higher uh, capacity to generate ribosomes. Um, but there are also many cancers that, that don't have um, don't have large nuclei. Um, I said that the size of the uh, of an organelle of a, of a membraneless organelle scales with the size of the cell, but that's assuming that the concentration is fixed. So how does a cell control the concentration of components during growth? Um, so we kind of push the, the question back down, you know, turtle, one turtle from, um, uh, from size to concentration. Um, and then finally, um, and Li Shi um, uh, touched on this a little bit and, and where we've been in, in discussions about this, is how does the cell um, control the size of multiple candidate states at the same time? Um, so there are two nucleoli because there are two ribosomal DNA sites in, in worms, there, but there are dozens to hundreds of pea granules in the cell, pea bodies, stress granules, et cetera. And if you look at the um, size distribution of them, they're all within a relatively narrow range. Um, and it's not at all obvious why, why or how this, this would be the case. Um, and so with that, I wanna thank um, my lab at McGill. A lot of this was actually started um, during my postdoc um, at Princeton with Cliff and Shravanti. And um, we are also recruiting. So if you're interested in any of these questions, um, feel free to get in touch. So we have, thank you, Stephanie, uh, for this wonderful talk. We only have a couple of minutes left of the time we had budgeted. So we, we're gonna make, we have a couple, take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, and if you can get, uh, so one, the first question that was, I think, asked by Ilya, Ilya Nemanman, was he said, I've been listening to all of these fabulous talks and thinking about the topic of the workshop, general principles. I've, I find it hard to find general principles even across subcellular systems that we've been hearing about. And as we go to larger systems, it'll become even more harder. You can ask the speaker or speakers to say what they think the general principles might be. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I tried to get at that a little bit with, um, with this slide, so so we can we can think about okay, you know, depending on the structure, there are different factors that um, that do transport or that that add um, or remove components. But basically, um, as 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 Lishi said and and um, Wallace said in their talks, uh, you it, it's a balance between addition and removal of of components of of volume of of single you know molecules at the end of a cytoskeletal filament, and um, and each. Each different, you know, type of um, of organelle or or structure is going to have, you know, details that that are different. But but the I think the overall theme is what controls the um, growth and and shrinkage of whatever structure you're studying. And and we can we can look at you know specific um, different factors and and. Um, both Shashank and, and Maria showed all of these, you know, crazy complexities. Um, but I think the those are, you know, details that we can use to, to tune our models. But the, the main um, uh, principle is, is how are things added? How, how are things removed? And what is the balance between them? And how can cells regulate that balance? Okay. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. So one, one last question, and we can kind of touch briefly on that. There's a big spirited debate going on in the chat window uh, that says it's not liquid liquid phase separation. Uh, there is no size control with liquid liquid phase separation. Have you considered uh, short range attraction and long range repulsion as the mechanism behind this? Sorry, I guess I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, Why I, isn't... I, I think it would, it would be better if you, if you jump into the chat window. I can't. There, okay. There's this debate going on, strong one, like between at least five to six people. Uh, so that would be, I think, pretty cool to kind of get. Uh, they're basically discussing about, about you know the importance of phase separation in many of these processes. That's kind of how we are supposed to go about it. So with that, I'm going to hand okay. over. I'll to jump to YouTube then. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Right. So deep and take over. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephanie. That was a beautiful talk. Um, and also Shashank. Uh, so I'll um, we'll we'll have our next speaker, Ken Anderson from um, uh, from um, uh, who's it? I mean from Denmark. Uh, so he. He, he has been a professor um, in, in the theoretical marine ecology uh, department uh, at DTU. And so he's, um, he's also a deputy chair uh, in the Center for Ocean Life. 
Uh, so he did his PhD from uh, in physics from uh, in 2000 uh, in 1999 from Copenhagen University, and then he moved to do a postdoc at La Sapienza Institute of Physics in Rome. Uh, so I'm handing over to him. He's going to talk about some really exciting stuff related to marine biology, basically. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction and the chance to speak here today. So I'm going to start a completely different place. We have heard a lot about single cells and I'm going to uh, zoom all out here and look at the entire ocean, which I will be talking about. And what we see here is a signature of life in the and, ocean. Uh, just a second, your, your presentation is not in the presentation mode. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, it's... Yeah, we're only seeing you, the presenters mode, uh, mode right now. Okay, I see. Well, I'll try something else. Uh, just a second. You possibly have multiple screens. Mm, yeah, well, we'll see. Um, I'll reshare here. So we'll try again. Does okay, that work? That works really well. Okay, sorry for that. Yeah, no so, um, so, um, so I'm going to start a different place with looking at the, the Earth from space. And what we're seeing is a signature of unicellular light. This is chlorophyll, as we see here. And that is essentially acts as a machine. It's a machine that's ultimately driven by sunlight. It's a machine that drives all the major cycles of matter in the ocean, the carbon, the nutrients, etc. And then those cycles are key in actually regulating our climate. And they also have functions for us as humans. They are responsible eventually for the pro production of protein. 15% of the protein that we eat as humans come from fish. <clears throat> um, but the diversity among these cells here uh, are huge. And even if you just look at the size of different cells, they may vary a factor of eight orders of magnitude, much more even than the size difference between a mouse and an elephant. Um, so the question I have here and what I'm trying to illustrate today is how can we, if we just know something about the fundamental things from physics, about diffusion, fluid mechanics, geometry, uh, reaction kinetics, et cetera, et cetera, how much can we say about the diversity of this mass of organism their structure and eventually their function, the ecosystem functions. Uh, and what I'm going to look at is now back to single cells and want to look at how they acquire resources and how different size cells require acquire resources. And they can do that in three ways. The first way is to be an active feeder. So the cell can swim around or make a feeding current and grab uh, resources this way. The way we can understand that is essentially the are uh, swimming through the water with a certain diameter, and then they are moving with a speed that roughly scales with the length of the, or the diameter of the cell. That means that their clearance rate, the volume that they sweep per time, scales with their own volume or with their diameter to the third power, as I've shown here. And if you look at data here from nanoflagellate to fish larvae, that is indeed what we see here. But you can also be a phototrophic organism, something that lives off the light. Uh, and we could think about that being a volume process as well. You could fill up this entire cell with the chloroplast and, and fix a lot of light this way and carbon this way. But that's not how it works because the chloroplast in the center of the cell would be shaded by the chloroplast in the, in the fringes. So essentially you're limited by your, your cell surface, which scales with the square of your diameter. So it's what I call a surface process as we see from data. But you cannot live on the carbon that you fix from light alone. You need nutrients as well. Nutrients is acquired by passively by diffusion. So they're sitting there waiting for nutrients molecules to diffuse towards the cell where they can grab them. That is limited by the cell surface as well. But it's also limited by a more important process that is the rate at which things diffuse towards a sphere that absorbs them. That's a classic problem in diffusion physics. And it turns out that the, that flux of matter scales actually with the radius of that sphere. There's also data there. It looks not as good as the other ones. There are reasons for that, but I don't want to go into that now. I'd rather like to look at with these three different processes, which are the main processes of acquiring food here, how much can we say about the diversity of the unicellular ecosystem in the ocean? So with that, so, 
I will look at how much do what is the rate of food encounter, what is the mass per time they encounter food, and that is essentially the clearance rate that I looked at before, the volume per time multiplied by the concentration of the matter that they want to get. Example: Let's say you have bacteria that want to take up dissolved organic matter. Typical concentration: five microgram carbon per liter. This would be your encounter rate here. We're using the linear rate because it's diffusive encounter. While if you are a, a heterotroph that's actively feeding for smaller cells, another concentration, 100 microgram carbon here, it's a volume law. And we clearly see that if you're big, you're better off being actively searching. If you're small, you're better off just waiting for things to diffuse towards you. In between those size ranges here of cells, <clears throat> we have the phototrophs. And then they need to combine two processes, the surface rule for fixing carbon from the ocean, and the linear rule from the diffusion of matters towards them. So essentially limited by the envelope of these two here. And from that, we can actually see several things now. The smallest organism would be osmoheterotroph. They are taking stuff off diffusively, or bacteria. Intermediate sizes would be phototrophs. Larger sizes would be heterotrophs, animals, kind of single cellular animals. But there's more to it. Let's look at this size range here. This size range, you are best off if you actually uh, feed on smaller organisms. But think about it here. The food you're getting has a carbon and nutrient ratio that's about the same carbon and nutrient ratio as yourself. But before you can divide, you need to burn some of that carbon for your metabolism. So that means you actually end up with a surplus of nutrients that you're leaking, which is a pity in a nutrient in a situation where you're competing for nutrients. But what they can do is they can actually acquire some, for some, some chloroplast and become green and essentially use the, the, the ATP that they get in this way to drive their metabolism. They use them as kind of solar cells and they become plant animals or what we call mixotrophs. They're green animals. This, it turns out, is actually a very dominant strategy among unicellular organisms, unlike in the terrestrial world. Now, this is just an example if I have a certain uh, amount of concentration of the, the resources. But of course, this changes if you change concentration of resources. Here's your typical gradient in the ocean from the oligotrophic open desert deserts with low nutrients and high light and up to the eutrophic high nutrient, low light conditions. And we see how that changes the structure. In the oligotrophic, you have more mixotrophs, you have smaller phototrophic cell. In eutrophic, you have larger phototrophic cells, exactly as we know when we're looking out in the oceans. So we see that these simple principles here about encounter that's limited by physics essentially determines the macroecological patterns of diversity in the ocean. What I want to do next is to go see, and can we use the same principles to also know something about the structure and the function of these ecosystem? And what I, I'll, I'll do there is essentially create a model of the simple cell with exactly the principles and the parameters that we have, have here combine it with the, the, uh, the mechanism that this, the bigger cells would eat smaller cells and put it all together in an ecosystem model. And this is what you get out of that model here. And you can try it out. There are, are two links here uh, where you can, this is a, a, an online simulator. It may be a bit stressed if many people go on, but you can try. What you get out of that would be here, if you have a size, you're getting the, the biomass of different size cells. And you see the same as before, Smaller cells are kind of bacteria, osmotrophs, light limited phototroph, a wide range of mixotrophs and heterotrophs. And we can change the conditions here, light and nutrients. For instance, if we lower the light, we see that there will be less biomass, there'll be more light uh, limited phototroph and more mixotrophs. <clears throat> so that we can see that actually these fundamental principles here even drive the general ecosystem structure. And you can go further on and look at the ecosystem functions. So uh, from that, you can calculate the, the, one of the main functions. What is the, the total primary production here? And we get what we have typically seen the range of 100 to almost 1,000 grams of carbon per square meter per year. And we can also see how much of that production becomes available for the higher trophic levels that are feeding on the unicellular plankton and eventually become available for fish. So you get the entire function of the ecosystem as well in this way here. So 
with this, I hope I have given you some kind of idea of the project that we have in our lab. That is to say, if we try to look at really the fundamental principles uh, that's limited to physics, diffusion, fluid flow, geometry, reaction kinetics, physiology, when we're talking about larger organisms, how much can we actually say about the diversity, structure, and function of the ecosystem? And I put a few references up here from our lab and from other labs that I think are important in that. And just would round off by a few, what I see is the open question. And the main here is really, when you want to, to do this, to scale up to from the single cells to the entire ecosystem, you need to think about which are the fundamental principles that best constrain the entire ecosystem function. What I've shown here is, and what I believe is some of the fundamental ones are those that's related to how you acquire resources. Uh, and that was also why I think a lot of what we have seen before about cell motility and the fundamentals of that are key, because these are the ones that determine eventually the structure and the function of the microbial communities and essentially are needed if you want to understand how the earth works. So that I will be happy to take further discussions uh, on the questions here. And thank you very much for being here and inviting me. Thanks a lot, uh, Ken. That was that was beautiful, and it also gave us a flavor of the other like other um, scale essentially. Uh, so, do we have any questions from the panelists? Uh, so, I I have one question. So, so we have been listening to all the molecular level stuff, and now you have uh, I mean you have this kind of um, next I mean next scale that 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 you probe. The question is, uh, do you? Um, like, do you see any signatures at the molecular level of, of these various arguments that you are making, the general physical arguments? Or have you ever attempted to, or, or what are your thoughts if one tries to see the see if there is any signature of that? Of what goes on? Well, it, essentially what I would love to see is that to, to go further down from the molecular level and understand what are the constraints down at the molecular level that that are responsible for these scalings I see with size here, for instance. <clears throat> so uh, one thing I was thinking about the talk with Dan Fletcher, he talked about the, the extra the molecules on the surface. And I was thinking very much about what how do these are also responsible, for instance, for, for capturing food? Are there different ways of capturing food that we can use to understand deeper the principles of resource capture, for instance? The other one that's important here is the barrier of diffusion across the cell, cell uh, membrane. How do they actually take in uh, molecules and how do they avoid getting lost rid of the molecules that they want to keep in? Mm, I see. I see. And, uh, and, and so uh, clearly there is, I mean, the, the, the various aspects of the fluid, uh, because you are talking about marine life, uh, has a role. So how does this differ from like usual... Uh, like um, land life, essentially. <laughs> Enormously. I mean, uh, mainly from where the primary production happens. What's special here about marine life is primary production happens at unicellulose. You have, I mean, apart from a few plants along the coast, all the primary production happens at the unicellular level. Whereas on land, where trees can build wonderful structures and leaf, where they can put the, the, the chloroplast up in the, in the light, we have a completely different structure of the ecosystem. So they are very differently structured on land and on in the water. One very important thing also in water is you have this rule that's fairly strong that bigger organisms eat smaller organisms throughout and you create very long food chains. Actually the food chains in the ocean can have up to, up to five trophic levels from you go from the unicellular phototrophs here up to fish or whales. <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's quite beautiful. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, Wallace has a question. So, so based on what you were saying about larger things eat smaller things, but are there, I, I feel like there must be cases where the, where the larger thing eats a smaller thing, but then the smaller thing remains behind, remains in the larger one as, as an endosymbiont. Absolutely. And what yeah. happens, in, is there a clear picture in that case? Does the, does the larger thing tend to then get smaller because it no longer has to prey on other? Or, well, or I, is there some adaptation to having now primary production in a very large, large organism? Well, the example I can think of are, are those mixotrophs, the plant animals there. And they get their chloroplast in various ways. And one way they can do it is 
what people sometimes call kleptotrophs. They are eating a, a phototroph, and then they take out the chloroplast. Sometimes they just use the chloroplast until it perish. Sometimes they actually nurture it and keep it alive and so on. But I don't think it, it changes the, the cell, the, the predatory cell very much, apart from they're using it like that. I had one question I was wondering. Uh, so in, in terms of there are unicellular organisms that form these colonies, that's something that's kind of, kind of part of the work that I'm interested in myself and form these multicellular like bigger structures at a different scale. And that, that happens in, in case of ciliates, for example. And I've been interested in, uh, and uh, related to what, what, what Wallace has been doing, and we've kind of been doing some things on how, how do these single cells behave like multicellular structures uh, or organelles. So how, what are your thoughts on size control in that regime? So what are you talking about? Colony formation of different, yeah. I think colony formation is important. We see it in many cells. Um, and uh, we are just trying to begin to understand what it, what it do, does and why they do it. And it, one of the things that we are focusing on, I mean, in, in, the, in the general community, I could say, is again, acquisition of resources, but actually rather the other way around, namely the protection from the predators. So usually when you become larger, there will be fewer predators and you get a, a lower predatory pressure. So you can, by making a colony, for instance, like Trigodesmium, will believe that you are getting lower risk of actually being eaten. Sometimes it works the other way. If the predators have a size where they actually take the, can take the colonies, then, then it's better off being small and then they actually leave their colonies. But I think we're just trying to get towards that part of the question. And it has all to do with protection, protection against predation which is as important as the resource acquisition, but harder to work with. Right, I think that that's really interesting. And then that's something we've been thinking about. We should kind of continue this discussion uh, offline. One little addition to that, when you said in terms of protection from the predator, I can also imagine, again, this is a naive part probably, but for the predator, it's also kind of easier to eat because you're basically getting a big amount of resources at the same place instead of trying to hunt. So there isn't yeah, that pressure coming from the other side? Yeah, but it, it, you have, we have to think about what is the nature of the environment here. They are in a very, very thick viscous fluid, and it's actually hard to grab things. And you can, if the things are too hard, too, too, too small, I mean, they don't have the appendages or whatever it is to actually grab hold of them. So usually there's a size range that they can, can, can work with. The same goes for filter feeders there. There's a size that fits into the filter. Right. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Thank, thanks a lot, Ken. That was beautiful to hear. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Carl Nicholas. Um, uh, Carl is, a, uh, is the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor Emeritus at Cornell University. He did his PhD in, uh, in paleobiology from the University of Illinois and did his postdoctoral work at Big Bird College in, in London as a Fulbright uh, his fellow. So his research interests uh, lie in biomechanics, allometry, and plant evolutionary biology. So and we'll hear something something along those lines. Thanks a lot. I mean, yeah, you're, you, it's the stage is yours, Carl, please. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so the title of my presentation is a, a phylogenetic approach to how size can be regulated across different kinds of organisms. And I want to introduce a concept called the dynamical pattern module concept. And that is loosely defined as any kind of subsystem um, that, or assembly system that's either uh, actuated or suppressed resulting in one or more output signals that evoke a developmental response in tandem with the feedback uh, system. So here is a, a little diagram uh, showing uh, what I mean by a module, a dynamical patterning module. Uh, you have some kind of an assembly system that performs a developmental uh, process that or evokes a developmental process. It results in output signals uh, that then result in the developmental results. And there's got to be a feedback element and a comparator uh, that then either activates or deactivates this entire process. And so what I want to do is show a few examples of this as kind of a generic approach to the question, what essentially regulates size? And, um, as one example, 
I'll point out that uh, these modules perform the same function, but they use very, very, very different uh, ways of achieving them. And so one example that you might think of is when multicellular organisms evolved from colonial organisms, there had to be some kind of adhesive that holds cells together. And if you look at you look at the different intracellular adhesives that are used by different kinds of organisms, you see that those ad adhesives are biochemically very, very different. And you can just make a comparison here between what metazoans use, which are cadherin proteins, versus what land plants use. The embryophytes are land plants. They use rhamnogalacturonic dominated pectins. So in one case, you use proteins, and in another, you're actually using carbohydrates. And these materials are, are quite different structurally. Nevertheless, this is the way the two largest multicellular groups of organisms achieve multicellularity. So let's step back to a little bit more of a complicated uh, view of dynamic patterning uh, modules. And the example that I could use here is how do cells, plant cells, expand? How do they actually uh, manifest growth? Well, remember that unlike um, animal cells, plant cells are encapsulated within a very rigid uh, cell wall made of things like cellulose, hemicellulose, and a number of other components. And the way in which permanent growth in a plant cell is achieved is essentially that the rigidity of the cell wall has to be loosened. Then you have to import water, increasing the internal pressure. And then not to go back to a plastic deformation, you have to re the cell wall so that the increase in volume uh, is more or less permanent. And so I've diagrammed uh, just two aspects of how this is achieved by looking, first of all, of how you transport and localize the chemistry in the cell wall that has to be loosened. And then in addition to actually how you hydrolytically loosen and then solidify the cell wall. I don't have time to get into all of these details, but the basic architecture of these two modules conform to the same basic canonical parts. Now I want to step back and ask perhaps what seems um, a, a superfluous or maybe unnecessary question, but I think the answer is really very important and that is how do we quantify size? What do we mean by size? In some of the previous talks, we saw people talk about size in terms of length and we just heard how size can be described in terms of surface area or volume. Uh, but which of these, is it a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or a three-dimensional uh, quantification of size becomes extraordinarily important, particularly when we have to recognize that size, geometry, and shape are three very different things in an organismic way. I don't need to tell you that geometry and shape are not the same thing and that you can maintain the same geometry while changing your size or that you can change size as you change your geometry and or your shape. So the real question then is what do we mean by size? So I've taken these very simple geometric forms, spheres and spheroids. Here you see the prolate spheroids, here you see oblate spheroids, and here you see cylinders. And I've shown that in the category of spheroids, you can take basically the same volume and deform it in a variety of ways that results in very different geometries and very, very different shapes. And the same thing is true for the basic geometry of cylinders. Now, does this have any real meaning biologically? I'll show you this. These are data that I've accumulated from heterotrophs, uh, photoautotrophs, uh, mostly algae, and then a, a particular genus of green plant called Spirogyra. And what you're looking at is the log of surface area plotted uh, against the log of volume. Now, what's interesting to me is that if all of these cells, these are all 
unicellular organisms, if all of them were Euclidean, in the sense that they conform to surface area scaling as length squared and volume as that reference length cubed, you'd expect the slope of this log log plot to be two thirds. And that's shown here by this dashed blue line. It turns out, however, that if you actually plot the data, the slope is not two thirds, it's three fourths. Um, now that geometry, shape change, and size shape is also illustrated here. The smallest organisms are mostly spherical. As you increase in size, the geometry of these organisms, unicellular organisms, become spheroidal. And then when you get to the very largest, at least in this data set, they're filamentous, filamentous green algae. Um, so why not two thirds? Why three fourths? Well, there's actually a theory, the West Enquist Brown theory, that says that size here is really controlled by a, a fractal architecture of infrastructure of cellular organization. And you might think of, well, there's an internal surface area in the, in the case of ER, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. And when you go through the mathematics of this theory, you actually see that basic physiological functions and even things like surface area and volume scale with scaling exponents of one fourth or multiples of one fourth. Now, another question that we talk about uh, when we talk about regulating size is first of all, is the size of an organism limited? In many cases, of course it is. And we can talk about, is there size limitation? Well, in some organisms, there's determinant growth in size. And in other cases, there's indeterminate growth in size. And I've illustrated here snakes and trees. Uh, these things in theory can get bigger and bigger over the lifetime. Whereas in the case of determinant growth, there is an ultimate maximum size and then the organism uh, I, just stops growing. And then when you talk about indeterminate growth, what's the limitation mechanism? Well, in the cases of vertebrates like pythons and snakes and fish, um, nutritional limitations define uh, the extent to which size can increase indefinitely. In the case of organisms like trees, there are physical limitations, as for example, the extent to water can be hydraulically transported from roots to the upper reaches of the canopy. So let's step back and ask ourselves, is size, is size controlled in the same way? Now, these are two diagrams showing uh, what provokes cell division. Here on the left, this is a Schrickii coli. And here on the right, you see how cell size is limited after cell, uh, just before cell division uh, in the case of the division yeast. Now in the case of E. coli, it turns out that the cell learns how to divide uh, by an oscillatory migration of a series of proteins that uh, migrate from one end of the cell to the next. And this oscillator is actually uh, registered uh, as a chronometer. It, the cell somehow or another senses how long does it take. And if the threshold of that timing is exceeded, the cell begins to form a division plate and the cell divides. So maximum size here is determined by an internal molecular chronometer. In the case of the division yeast, it's a totally different mechanism, which I can't really get into, but it's a zone of inhibition uh, that once again is regulated by proteins. Um, now let's step back and talk about determinant growth. And I'm using here an example of an organism that is called Volvox. This is a green alga. Uh, and it turns out that not only is the maximum size of this multicellular organism limited, but it's limited also in terms of cell number. Uh, as these things grow and mature, they reach a maximum number of cells 
Uh, and then the organism as its whole increases overall in size by each of these cells producing uh, more of an agastic external envelope around it. And so the entire organism increases in size without increasing either the number of cells or the size of the individual cells. Uh, now, what about indeterminate growth? And you know, one of the best examples I think in biology is the growth of trees. They continue to grow throughout their lifetime. Um, what is really curious about it though, and most people don't think about it, but I'd like the audience to think about it, is that even though the overall organism increases in size, the growing tips of each of these branches is actually the result of the apical meristem, the growing tip of the stem. And it turns out that whether you're looking at uh, plants like Arabidopsis, tomato, corn, or rice, uh, the mechanisms within the apical meristem control the size of the apical meristem. The apical meristem gets to a certain size. It never exceeds that size. So curiously, you have indeterminate organismic growth as a consequence of very tight control determinant growth of the growing tips. It turns out in almost all of these four examples, uh, the control is a negative feedback loop. Uh, again, controlled by, uh, in this case of Arabidopsis, uh, two categories of gene products called Clavada and Vuchel. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have to get into the details. So let's go back to dynamic patterning modules. The, the philosophy that I'm trying to export from my way of thinking to others is that you have these regulatory systems that achieve what look like phenotypically the same results, but they use different components within the organism itself as for example cell adhesion in metazoans being the result of specialized proteins and in the case of uh, multicellular terrestrial plants uh, carbohydrates the galactouronic acid pectins um, but if we look at multicellular organisms as a whole um, I kind of tried to diagram what I think to be of the basic components that have to be considered. For example, cell size and cell number. There have to be modules that control the proliferation of cell division. These in turn have to be controlled by the cell cycle. These have to be controlled by growth promoters and developmental signals that can be controlled by nutrient availability, external factors. Then when you talk about cell size, Again, you can talk about things like ploidy levels or these haploid, diploid, polyploid, and cell size sensors. And so you get this rather beautiful, I think, uh, interchange between things that are controlling cell size, cell number. And then when you talk about complicated multicellular organisms and you talk about things made up of different tissue systems and different organs, there have to be regulators that control the individual size of organs and the types of tissues that are scaling with the size of the overall organism. For example, as pythons get bigger, the snakes get bigger in their size, or as fish get bigger in their size, their skeletal architecture has to increase in size proportional to the total organism. So some conclusions, uh, organismic size can be determinant. Examples, fruit flies and human beings, indeterminate trees and snakes are good examples. Size can be controlled either genomically, internally or physically. Uh, and there are different mechanisms that regulate size, which I'm calling uh, examples of dynamical patterning mod modules that perform the same function, but they're not homologous across different clades, different groups of organisms. So thank you. And if you have questions to ask me, uh, I'm kind of opening myself up, but there's my email. You can contact me that way. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Carl. That was 
that was really nice. Uh, it was give us uh, another again. It's, it's very different from the other speakers, so that way it was really fascinating. Do you have any questions from the panel members? Okay, uh, so we have uh, one question from Ilya Nemanman. I think it, it and it uh, it might be something that Carl and Ken both can answer actually. Uh, so he asks like for a collective system, multicellular uh, multi multicellular organisms or ecology, the ability to communicate information across the system should limit the size. When is communication a stronger limit than food or physics? So essentially kind of, yeah. So I think uh, given- well, I, I can try and answer this in terms of the West Brown Enquist theory that talks about scaling as a function of one fourth to three fourths or, or multiples of one fourth. In fact, that theory proposes that the rate at which nutrients can be transported from one part of an organism uh, has a profound effect, a constraint on overall organismic size because the entire fractal architecture of multicellular and even potentially unicellular organisms is presumably uh, the result of evolution, minimizing the time it takes to transport nutrients from one part of the organism to the other while maximum, maximizing the efficiency of that transport system. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's true, um, is still hotly debated in the ecological literature. Um, and I don't wanna get into uh, the, the kind of vitriolic kinds of debates. Uh, the, the problem of course is um, that that theory, the West Brown Enquist theory, the basic assumptions have never been tested themselves. Only the predictions of that model have been tested. In other words, are the scaling phenomena that we see one scaling exponents of one fourths or multiples of one fourth. And uh, across vast data sets, those predictions have been validated, but the basic assumptions of the models have not. And you, I can propose alternative assumptions that lead to the same experimental predictions uh, of one fourth scaling exponent. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you. So uh, Ilya is basically, Ilya again writes, so he says that uh, he's not necessarily talking about physical transport, but information transport. So that well, phys Physical transport is one form of information, isn't it? So if you look at the phloem system, this is the sap conducting system in trees. It, is, it goes as a system, almost an arterial system from roots to the growing tips of the highest branches. And the phloem system is actually a living protoplasmic conducting system. And we know that in that system is messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is actually being transported from developing leaves to the tips of growing roots and in the reverse direction. So uh, when you talk about the conveyance of information, don't restrict it to synaptic functions in mammals. Uh, just think about uh, the molecular transport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, so I think also maybe it's also motivated by some of these um, people's work on um, bird flocks. And there people have thought about how Block, I mean, the information that they can exchange between them that controls the size of the overall flock, uh, things like that. I think that's that he was trying to get at. I might be wrong a little bit there, but I think in East, isn't uh, the, the growth and the assembly of the cell wall controlled via the vesicular transport? Mm -hmm. That would also kind of feel, again, it's a difficult way, a different way of defining what information would be in this case. So that would be yeah. the other one. I don't know if Ken had any thoughts on that topic in that question. Ken actually, I think, is replying to the WhatsApp thing. So, uh, does anyone else uh, has any question? Or wonderful. Okay, awesome. I, I think that with that uh, in mind, uh, Carl, thanks so much for for the ending the ending the session and ending our meeting today by you know combining the molecular and the uh, ecosystemic scale. So that was the kind of put together everything that we've talked about today, starting from uh, Wallace's talk and ending with your talk. That's kind of a perfect uh, way to end the, end the session. Uh, thanks so much for all of you, all the speakers for uh, coming in and all everybody who's been listening to us on YouTube uh, since the morning. And 
fortunately, we're still in time. So we're still in the time that we had uh, uh, agreed on. So uh, I'm glad we could kind of all, everybody kept time and went, went with it. And uh, with that, I think without like, any extra talk, I would kind of just remind you all one more time about the next workshop that's, that's scheduled for December 4th by uh, Ch Chetan Pandyanath. And he's gonna be talk, having a workshop that will be on what could neural dynamics have to say about neural computation and do we know how to listen? Please join us for that. And with that, I would like to end uh, today's workshop and thank more, more importantly, my co-organizer Sandeep, who's been a great co-host for this and then helps you. organize the workshop. And thanks so much to TMLS for the resources and for TR Ward for helping us with the uh, organization in the back, background. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all of you. Bye, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.